Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion 15625 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Budget Scotland No. 3 Bill. I would encourage all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary for Finance to speak to and move the motion. I am pleased to lead this debate today on the principles of the Budget Bill and I welcome the Finance and Constitution Committee's report on the Budget. Presiding Officer, in the face of the chaos and turbulence from the UK Government, I urge the Scottish Parliament to deliver certainty and stability for Scotland by supporting the principles of the Budget Bill. This Scottish Budget prepares our economy for the opportunities of the future enables the transformation to a low-carbon economy and builds a more inclusive and just society. I have listened carefully to the opposition parties. The Tories demanding tax cuts for the highest earners with their raise less, spend more hypocrisy. The Lib Dems abandoning new spending on education, colleges, mental health and childcare for their constitutional obsession. <laughs> and Labour... and Labour, where sources predicted their party would deliver incompetence instead of an alternative budget, and that's what we got. <laughs> to vote against the budget at stage one. To vote against the budget at stage one. I thought I would start with a consensual note. <laughs> to vote against the budget at stage one imperils the ability to raise the necessary revenues to fund our public services. It would have been reckless in the extreme. And to do so at a time when we have a UK government that is engaging in systematic damage to our economy, austerity by choice and Brexit by design would have been even more damaging. The UK government... The UK Government cannot be trusted to act in Scotland's interests. The Scottish Government will. As previously stated, if we face a no-deal Brexit, I will have to revisit the Scottish Budget. However, I can confirm today that I have reached an agreement with the Greens that will secure the passage of the Budget at every stage. Now, I know that for councils, the ability to make more decisions locally is a key request. This government will therefore take steps to empower Scotland's local authorities. I will set out measures today. I hear the Conservatives growing at empowering Scotland's local authorities. I will set out measures today that will deliver the most significant empowerment of local authorities since devolution. COSLA has made the case for councils to have the power to apply a levy on transient visitors. For the Greens, this was a key issue in the budget negotiations. The Scottish Government will now undertake a formal consultation on the principles of a locally determined visitor levy before introducing legislation that would permit local authorities to adopt such a policy. The National I'll take an intervention, since you're so persistent, Mr. Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. I thank the Finance Minister for taking an intervention. In his agreement with the Greens, could he tell us when he plans to abolish the council tax? Cabinet Secretary of Finance. Oh, be patient, Mr. Rumbles. I'm coming to that. The national discussion on this issue has illustrated a range of important issues to consider. That information will help us get the structure right for the tourist industry as well as for local authorities. This government takes no view on whether council should introduce such a levy, but these actions go a step towards providing local authorities with the power. There have also been an ongoing debate about providing local councils with the power to apply a levy on workplace car parking. And this is a topic best managed at the local level enabling local authorities to manage congestion, air quality and local transport. Subject to the specific exclusion of our NHS and hospitals, this government will agree with the Greens an amendment to the Transport Bill that would enable those local authorities who wish to do so to have the power. The final transfer of power to local authorities will be the devolution of empty properties rates relief to local authorities by the next revaluation. 
In each of these cases, it will be for local authorities, taking into account local circumstances, the views of the business community and the electorate, to decide whether to use them. This government recognises the importance of longer-term budget stability for local authorities, and we will work with COSLA to move towards three-year budget settlements from 2020-21 and to develop an agreed fiscal framework for introduction in the next Parliament. The Green Party has also sought to return to the conclusion of the Cross-Party Commission on Local Tax Reform, and the present council tax system must end. Uh, the Government will convene cross-party talks to progress this. If agreement can be reached, legislation would be developed, though it would be for the next Parliament to implement. There will be no change during this Parliament to the Council tax system. <laughs> Presiding Officer, the draft budget increases funding for local government, providing total support of over £11 billion and an overall real terms increase in the total local government settlement of around £210 million. However, I have heard the arguments. I'll take uh, an intervention from Kezia Dugdale. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking that intervention. If it's such a good deal for local government, can you explain why my constituents are facing £41 million worth of cuts from their SNP council? Chair Mackay. They won't be by the time I've finished this speech. <laughs> However... <laughs> However, I've heard the arguments. I've just heard it again for more funding to be provided through raising income tax or business rates or greater flexibility over council tax. And I've been clear throughout this process that I will not change income tax rates and business rates. We have set rates and we will stick to them. However, we have agreed an alternative package of support to Scotland's local authorities. As part of the agreement with the Greens, we will provide flexibility by capping council tax at 3% in real terms, or 4.79%. I encourage councils to take account of household incomes and remain at a flat 3%. However, this gives councils the ability to raise an additional £47 million on top of the £80 million that they could already generate, whilst keeping increases below the maximal level permitted in England. I have also agreed additional funding direct to the Local Government Core Grant. Members will recall that in the budget, this government invested £55 million of additional funding in the NHS to make up for the shortfall in the Barnet consequentials we had been promised. Well, the Tories sold the NHS short. We filled the gap. The UK government has now confirmed that we can expect to receive further unexpected funding for the NHS and Barnet consequentials this year. And as a result, and using the additional flexibility in the management of the Scottish Budget, I'm able to deliver an additional £90 million for local government as part of their core settlement. Whilst also keeping our promise that all Barnet consequentials for health will go to health. In fact, our NHS budget will now be £4 million higher than set out in December. As a result, using council tax, additional flexibility to offset spending and extra direct funding, local authorities will now have up to £187 million of additional spending power in their budgets. And I can also confirm, as I have to the Greens, that the Scottish Government will transfer our share of the costs of the teachers' pay offer to local government if it is agreed, amounting to nearly £280 million over three years. Presiding, <laughs> presiding officer, with those changes, I hope this budget will win the support of Parliament. This budget provides a real terms increase in the education portfolio and supports investment of almost £500 million to expand early learning and childcare. It invests £600 million in Scotland's colleges, over £1 billion in Scotland's universities and over £214 million in apprenticeships and skills. This budget continues our work to tackle poverty and mitigate the worst impacts of UK government welfare cuts. With a total, of course... James Kelly. Thank Mr Mackay for taking the intervention. I draw his attention to the blog by the Fraser of Allender Institute 
which details the fact that only £27 million in the Scottish Government budget is directly targeted at low-income families. Surely that shows that his words on, or, on poverty are hollow indeed. Cabinet Secretary. Part, parts of the Labour Party were proposing deep cuts in Social Security yeah. pay, pay for other yeah. commitments. Whereas this government is spending more than the UK amount to uh, spend on social security. But importantly, this budget also makes provision for financial redress to survivors of historical child abuse and care, containing £10 million for advance payments to those persons who may not live long enough to apply to the statutory redress scheme. Our economic action plan, fully funded in this budget, will improve the competitiveness of our business environment. And we have committed £1.3 billion to support Scotland's seven cities and their regions to maximise economic opportunity. And as has been welcomed by business, we're limiting the increase in business rates poundage to 2.1%, uh, meaning over 90% of properties in Scotland will pay a lower poundage than they would in other parts of the UK. Our infrastructure investment totals more than £5 billion over the coming year, including £1.7 billion for transport and connectivity, £175 million for nursery and childcare buildings, and a record £826 million for housing to help deliver 50,000 affordable homes. £130 million will go to the establishment of the Scottish National Investment Bank and precursor investments. And we'll also establish a £50 million capital fund to ensure our town centres are thriving, sustainable places. And to ensure the safety of our communities, we'll provide a real terms increase in funding for police and the investment needed for the transformation of our fire and rescue service. And as part of the environmental measures this budget supports, in agreement with the Greens, we'll take action to increase the minimum levy for single-use carrier bags to at least 10p at the earliest opportunity. And we also agreed in principle to the introduction of charging on disposable drink cups and will act to take this forward following the report of the expert panel later this year. And this will also include consideration of whether some of the revenue from both charges can be placed under the control of local authorities. Our income tax system is fair and progressive and balanced to raise additional revenue from those who can afford it most. Our budget does not increase any of the rates of income tax and it protects low and middle income taxpayers by increasing the starter and basic rates by inflation. 55% of Scottish taxpayers will continue to pay less than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK. And that's before you consider any of the benefits of Scotland's <laughs> social entitlements, like state-funded university education, free prescriptions and concessionary travel, which we will continue to protect. And finally, who's thinking of voting against the budget tonight? will be voting against an increase in our direct investment in mental health, taking the overall funding for mental health to £1.1 billion, and voting against a £730 million increase in the health portfolio resource budget, funding that will deliver a further shift in the balance of spend towards mental health and primary community and social care. So, presiding officer, the budget we presented in December is good for Scotland. The proposals I have set out today deliver more powers, more funding and more flexibility to local government. This budget backs our economy and it funds our NHS. No opposition politician can claim ownership of policies in this budget if they vote against the means to pay for them at decision time tonight. So it is clear that Westminster is failing Scotland, whilst the Scottish Government is set to deliver a budget that safeguards Scotland as best we can. Getting on with the day job, delivering for Scotland. I commend the principles of this budget bill to the Parliament and I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Murdo Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 15625.1. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, it was bad enough that the draft bu budget published last month widened the income tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. 
But today we have even more taxes to come, thanks to the deal that Mr Mackay has done with the Greens. This was an SNP government, let's remember this, an SNP government elected on a manifesto commitment not to raise the rate of income tax for basic rate payers, a promise that they have broken. An SNP government elected on a promise to cap council tax increases at 3%, another promise they have broken. Another, an SNP government elected on a commitment not to introduce a tourism tax, another promise they have broken. And on top of that, today, we have the introduction of a new workplace levy. Presiding officer, this is a triple tax bombshell from this SNP government, and it will do nothing for the competitiveness of the Scottish economy. Presiding officer, Derek Mackay might think he is Doctor Who with Patrick Harvey as his assistant, but between them they will exterminate the opportunity for Scotland to grow its economy and be a good place to live and work and build a business. Now, presiding officer, does anyone seriously doubt that a deal was going to be struck between the SNP and the Greens, despite the annual charade that we see between the, the two uh, partners dancing around each other, trying to pretend there was no deal. No deal was just about as likely as Ross Greer winning Politician of the Year from the Churchill Appreciation Society. <laughs> and yet we were all strung along, made to think that this budget could fall. And the Greens, the Greens were very firm in advance of this budget. Nothing less than the abolition of the council tax and a wholesale reform of local taxation would get them on board. Instead, they've been sold short. What do we had? Just a fudge, just a fudge. Another promise of a round of cross-party talks. Mr Whiteman, you've been let down. I'll give Andy, way. Andy Whiteman. Thank the member for giving way. Murder Fraser. Apologies, presiding officer. Murder Fraser will be aware that it's not within the gift of the Scottish Greens to abolish the council tax. <laughs> It's, it is not within the gift of the SNP to abolish the council tax. This would require legislation, and no party in this parliament is in a majority. So I ask Murdo Fraser, given that there is a commitment to cross-party talks, to agree a replacement, to draft the legislation, will he A, take part in those talks, and will he do so on the basis of goodwill and a determination to scrap the regressive council tax. Murder Fraser. Presiding officer, I feel sorry for Andy Whiteman yeah. because the Greens and Andy Whiteman were so clear they would not be signing up to a budget that didn't commit to the end of the council tax. They have let their voters down. Presiding officer, Andy Whiteman famously wrote a book called Who Owns Scotland? The question today is who owns Andy Whiteman? And the answer to that is, it's Derek Mackay. <laughs> Presiding officer, the context... <laughs> Order, please. Order. <laughs> Order. <laughs> Order, please. Thank you. Thank you. Presiding officer, the context for this budget was that the Finance Secretary found himself in a healthier position than he was expecting, with Barnet consequentials of £950 million in the Scottish Block Grant following the Chancellor's announcement in October. An increase that means, according to Spice, the Finance Secretary's total budget is up in real terms on last year. And let's never forget that contrary to all the spin we hear from the SNP benches, the Scottish Government's total budget is up in real terms since 2010 by £1 billion. And the background to all the Scottish Government's financial choices is the Barnett formula, which at the latest estimate, according to the Scottish Government itself, delivers an additional £1,800 of additional spending for every man, woman and child in Scotland. That's a fiscal transfer to Scotland, a union dividend of more than £10 billion each year. And, presiding officer, what is the SNP policy on the Barnet formula on this multi-billion pound bonus to Scotland. They want to scrap it and create a black hole in the public finances of Scotland to the tune of £10 billion. That's why the greatest threat to our public services comes from independence and the continual threat of a second independence referendum. Now, against this backdrop of more money from Westminster, the Finance Secretary's choice was to extend the income tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK, meaning that those earning between £43,430 and 
will face a marginal tax rate of 53%. It means that public servants, such as police sergeants, senior nurse managers and principal teachers will be paying more tax than their counterparts south of the border, in some cases over £1,500 more. And it means that anyone earning over £27,000 will pay more than their equivalents south of the border. And that's even before the other tax increases we heard announced just a moment ago. These people are not rich, presiding officer. We're not talking about households earning just £27,000, but they are going to pay the price of having an SNP government. Yep. <laughs> what we wanted to see, presiding officer, in this budget is a focus on growing the economy, a focus the need for which was made apparent in the Scottish Fiscal Commission's report published in December. Because for each of the next four years, the Scottish Fiscal Commission are forecasting that the Scottish economy will grow at a lower rate than the UK as a whole, and that earnings here will grow more slowly. And this has consequences for the public finances, because a slower growing economy and slower rising earnings means less in terms of the tax take and less money to spend on public services. Madam of course I'll go away. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, true or false, uh, Mr Fraser, did the Scottish Fiscal Commission attribute those subdued figures uh, due to Brexit? Murder Fraser. I think it was the lack of productivity that they attributed it to, uh, presiding officer. And that is the challenge, that is the challenge the Scottish Government is failing to address right at the moment. And of course, Brexit applies across the whole United Kingdom. It is the relative performance of the Scottish economy to the rest of the UK that needs to uh, uh, concern us. But if we look at the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecast for income tax for the coming year, we see this illustrated perfectly. In the period between May and December last year, they revised downwards their income tax forecast by a staggering £661 million. Pounds. That's a cool two-thirds of a billion pounds we are potentially missing out on. Now, I appreciate that income tax is just one of the devolved taxes. We also have to look at the block grant adjustment. But we see the complete picture when we look at the Finance and Constitution Committee's report on the draft budget, paragraph 69, which confirms that in the 2019-20 budget, we now have a forecast net tax position £257 million down in real terms compared to where we were in December 2017. That is money we are losing. Now, presiding officer, these are only estimates, but in due course, all these figures will have an impact on actual spending. Table 8 of the Fiscal Commission's report shows the income tax reconciliations. For last year, the forecast reconciliation is 145 million, which will have to be met in the financial year 2020 to 21. But even more serious is the forecast outturn for this year, down 472 million pounds to be met in the budget for 2021-22. And that's another half a billion pound black hole in this government's forward budget plans. How the Finance Secretary must hope that these forecasts turn out to be wrong. Otherwise, he'll be the one writing a note to his successor saying, I'm sorry, there's no money left. Now, in the course of this debate, my colleagues will assess the Scottish Government's spending plans in more detail. But let me just highlight one example of spending in the Scottish Government's draft budget. International relations is a reserve matter. And yet this government is increasing the spending on international relations by a staggering 52% over two years, from 15.7 million to 23.9 million. They tell us there's no money to spend, presiding officer, and yet this is us funding Scottish ministers, grandstanding around the globe at our expense. If ever there were the area of spending that could be trimmed, surely that is it. Presiding officer, with Scotland's relative economic underperformance compared to the rest of the UK, we should have had a budget which focused on improving our economy on maximising the tax take from our growing economy, not on widening the tax gap and not on penalising those earners who are currently living here. Because every 20 new additional rate taxpayers we attract to Scotland would generate £1 million extra in tax revenue. An extra 2,000 additional rate taxpayers would give us a minimum of £100 million annually. And according to figures I heard quoted recently, a 1% increase in Scottish productivity, just 1% would deliver 2.3 billion extra in GDP and 400 million pounds extra in tax revenues. Rising wages deliver much higher revenues than increases in the tax rate. And there was a time, presiding officer, when people on the SNP front bench understood these simple laws of economics, but sadly these are now long gone. Presiding officer, we made an offer to the SNP in advance of this budget. We asked them to ditch their plans 
for an unwanted second referendum, to take action to narrow the tax gap rather than widen it, and then we can sit down and have a serious conversation about plans to grow the Scottish economy and how to support our public services. But rather than talk to us, they'd rather talk to the anti-growth, anti-business Greens. And instead of reducing the tax burden, they're going to put it up. And the consequence will be that the Scottish economy will continue to underperform and will have yet more taxes on hard-working families. That is not a direction we can support, presiding officer. And for that reason, we will vote against this budget at decision time tonight. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call on Bruce Crawford to speak to uh, the motion on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Officer. Can I begin by thanking the committee clerking team led by James Johnston? They have provided the committee with fantastic support. Can I also thank my colleagues on the committee for the constructive and consensual manner in which they approached our committee scrutiny of the 1920 budget? It's great credit to them all who have been able to agree a unanimous budget report. In the current polarised climate, I don't think it's, we can underestimate the power of politicians working together, laying aside their differences and agreeing a way forward. And there's no doubt in my mind that the country is crying out for such an approach in respect of the current Brexit stalemate. As colleagues across the chamber, I know, are aware, the, this budget scrutiny function has become increasingly complex and challenging as a result of additional tax powers having been devolved. And using the term complex again, I think I'm in danger of wearing out the use of the term as I seek to describe the challenges we face. Um, moreover, I might be seen as some risk of being seen sort of nutty professor from the University of the Fiscal Framework. But on a serious point, though, the committee is indebted to our advisor, David Iser, who's a great knack of unravelling the intricacies of the new model for devolution. <laughs> If you bear with me for a few moments, I think it's worth reating some of these intricacies because they are important. While challenging, it's incumbent on all of us across the chamber to an understanding of how the government budget is funded. Not least because the parliament now raises 40% of the budget in tax revenues. And as these tax revenues have been devolved, the size of the vote grant has simultaneously reduced. However, these are not one-off reductions. If this were the case, then clearly the impact of this the size of the reduction would decrease over time due to inflation. The initial reduction is therefore indexed through an annual adjustment to the block grant. This adjustment is based on the growth of devolved tax revenues relative to the equivalent taxes in the rest of the United Kingdom adjusted for population growth. But the real challenge here is that these adjustments are based on forecasts, which then need to be reconciled with outturn figures. This means that if the, when the forecast for income tax revenues, which form part of the budget for 1920, will not be reconciled with the actual tax receipts until outturn figures are published in July 21. And any difference between the forecast and outturn will not be addressed until the Scottish budget in 22-23, a full three financial years after the initial forecast. So that's the process. But what does it mean for the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament in practice? So, as you know, 2017-18 was the first year when this Parliament set our own rates and bans for income tax. And when the outturn figures for 17-18 are published by HMRC in July this year, we will have an initial indication of the actual impact of this new process in relation to income tax. As I said during the pre-budget on the, the budget, on the, the, the pre -budget debate last week, this will be an important moment and will pr prove a reality check for, for actual income tax receipts raised in Scotland. And as we explained in our budget report, there is a risk here for the Scottish Government. If in July we find out that those outturn figures result in a shortfall for 1718, this will require addressing in next year's budget. Alternatively, July's Outturn figures might produce a higher than forecast than, than we expected, resulting in a pleasant windfall for the Cabinet Secretary. However, based on the latest forecast for income tax raised in 1718, the Scottish Government is facing a potential shortfall of £145 million. I should remind colleagues, though, these are forecasts, and forecasts, as we know, by their very nature, invariably differ 
from the actual outturn. Nevertheless, this does provide an illustration of the risks involved and the increasingly difficult challenge that ministers now and in the future will face in managing these risks. Moreover, as the committee points out in the report, this also presents a challenge for this parliament in deciding our priorities for managing this risk. In particular, there will be political choices to make about further, for instance, we should address the risk by increasing the size of the Scotland Reserve. If this is the direction chosen, where would this money actually come from? Would colleagues be content if money used to support spending on important public services in the short term were instead saved to meet potential shortfalls in the medium term? Certainly. Mike Grumbles. I thank the member for giving way. Considering that we've just had extra spending announced uh, by the Finance Secretary, does he feel his committee is, should now examine that extra spending and find out exactly where it's coming from? Bruce Crawford. Well, as Mike Rumbles knows, that'll be a decision for the committee to make in, in due course. But, you know, but alternatively, um, we, we, we could be asking the Liberals here to actually describe if we're going to make a payment into the Scotland Reserve where that money would come from, if that's what he's considering. Alternatively, though, should the priority to be used borrowing powers within the fiscal framework, if needed, which would allow ministers to borrow up to £3 million, £300 million a year to deal with forecast error? But, officer, these are new and challenging choices that this Parliament is going to have to engage with and to grapple with. They are also choices that need to be more widely understood. The committee also heard concerns from witnesses that in Scotland there are 2 million adults who do not pay income tax. We also heard concerns that the gender balance of the income tax base, that there are 300,000 fewer women taxpayers, and that higher rate tax, tax, taxpayers comprise of 91,000 women and 275,000 men. Presiding officer, another important element of a report was Brexit, which I'll now return to. The OBR's most recent economic and fiscal outlook states the referendum vote to leave the EU appears to have weakened the economy, while they added uncertainty regarding the Brexit negotiations appears to have dampened business investment by more than earlier data suggested. The OBR also took account of the significant fall in the exchange rate that accompanied the referendum and its outcome. The OBR point out that the average quarterly growth has slowed from 0.6% between 2013 and 15 to 0.4% since the beginning of 2016, taking the UK from near the top of the G7 growth league table to near the bottom. The OBR also told us we had a forecast prior to the referendum, assuming there would be a vote to remain in the EU, that the economy would grow by roughly 4.5% between the time of the referendum and now. In the first forecast that we produced after the referendum, we reduced the figure to about 3%. The latest outturn data suggests that growth has been about 3.2%. Now, while these forecasts are not great, they do, not, they, they do assume an orderly Brexit as part, uh, as part of the negotiations. And the OBR also believes that a disorderly Brexit could have severe sub short-term implications for the economy the exchange rate, asset prices and the public finances. In the OBR's view, this could mean that UK asset prices fall sharply, which together with heightened uncertainty could cause households and businesses to rein in their spending. A fall in the pound would also raise domestic prices, squeezing households, real incomes and spending. Now, I make these points, President Officer, by way of background, because the committee was strongly of the view that a no-deal Brexit would be damaging to the Scottish economy and public finances, and therefore is clearly not in the national interest. In conclusion, the committee has previously emphasised the increasing volatility and certainty, as well as the upside and downside risks arising from the way the fiscal framework works, and in particular, the reliance on forecasts for the annual budget. The evidence we have considered in relation to the budget for 1920 reinforces this view. Officer, these are risks are exacerbated by the continuing uncertainty around Brexit, which both the SFC and OBR have hi highlighted as having a negative impact on business investment and economic growth. 
These are challenging times indeed, and we must rise to these challenges on behalf of the Scottish people. They rightly expect us to do just that. President Officer. Thank you, and I call on James Kelly to be followed by Patrick Harvey. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour will oppose this dreadful budget, which... Scottish Labour will oppose this dreadful budget, which is a weak response to the crisis facing public services. It's a cuts budget. It threatens the jobs of council workers. It fails to tackle the rising levels of poverty while handing tax cuts to high earners. What was needed in this budget? Well, what was needed in this budget was to address the issue of local government funding and produce a fair funding settlement and stop the cuts. In order to uh, address rising poverty levels, we needed a £5 rise in child benefit and an end to the two-child cap. And Labour also demanded reversing the increase, reversing the increase on rail fares and giving some much needed relief to the passengers who are too often left stranded on our platforms on their commute to their, to their jobs in the morning. Now, turning turning to, to local government, in spite of the, the announcement that's been made by the Cabinet Secretary, there are £319 million of cuts which were in the, in the budget published by Mr Mackay on December the 12th. And the announcement made today goes nowhere near closing that gap. <laughs> the other point I'd make to the Greens is this is the third year in a row that Mr Mackay has introduced a budget which it introduces, introduced a budget which has penalised local government and produce cuts, and yet again, the deal worked by the Greens doesn't close the funding gap in that year or in the previous years. Sure. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to Mr Kelly for giving way. Of those three years, could he explain to the Chamber precisely what scale of impact the Labour approach to budget engagement has achieved? How many changes... How many cuts have been prevented? How many local services saved? James Kelly. Let me. Order, please. Order. Let, let me make it absolutely clear. Labour will never sign up to a budget that's got cuts to local council services in it. Let me make some progress, Mr Mackay. What I would say to the Green Party, what I'd say to the Green Party is, I sat in this chamber week after week and I hear Green Party MSPs, including Mr Harvey, make noble speeches about reversing and stopping the cuts to council services, about tackling poverty and about fair taxation. This budget fails in all those three counts. So you're letting your members down, you're letting your supporters down by signing up to this, that, this budget tonight. In terms of the issue of uh, tackling poverty, it's an absolute scandal in modern Scotland that we have 230,000 children living in poverty. poverty. Each month in his uh, Renfrew North, North and West constituency, Derek Mackay holds a, constitu a constituency surgery in Gallow Hill. In Gallow Hill, 29% of children in that area uh, are living in child poverty. So, you know, what does that actually mean? Yeah, I'll certainly can. Cabinet Secretary. And I'd like to know why it is that the Labour Party would rather leave those children at the mercy of the Conservatives yeah. rather than take decisions. Yeah. And this Parliament yeah. to protect them. 
but presiding officer. But my please. intervention was this. By what percentage increase would the Labour Party raise the higher rate to pay for your budget demands? Because if you haven't done the costings, I have for you. James oh, Kelly. Oh, oh, oh. Just in, in terms of tax, first of all, we would, we would make sure... See all these Cabinet secretaries sitting on the, the front bench there? They, when they vote for the budget tonight, they're awarding themselves a tax cut. What an absolute... What an absolute scandal. And in terms, of, in terms of the issue of poverty, as the poverty and inequality report showed this morning, the government are only meeting four out of their 15 targets. And that shows you how, how remiss your budget is, Mr Mackay, in terms of addressing those issues. In, te in terms of... Real order, services. order a second, no, order, you. order. No, if members you. wish to make an intervention, could you please stand up and ask Mr Kelly if they wish to make an intervention, not just speak. No, I don't want to take the intervention. James Kelly. Because I want to point out that this is an unfair budget based on unfair taxation when it awards tax cuts up to everyone earning 124,000. So if you're a chief executive, or a managing director, or a cabinet secretary, then you're cheering this budget on tonight because it's going to give you a tax cut. But if you're a commuter, if you're a commuter on a, a platform waiting for a delayed train or a cancelled train, not able to get to your work or a hospital appointment, you won't be cheering this budget on. If the question that those MSPs in that middle section have got to answer tonight when you come to vote can you, can you look in the eyes of the council workers that are going to potentially face getting a P45 as a result of this budget? Can you, can you look to the families who don't go out to school in the morning, kids don't go out to school in the morning properly fed or properly clothed because they're living in poverty and aren't going to be helped by this budget? Can you... Can you apologise to the rail passengers who aren't going to get a rail freeze as a result of this budget? It's time for a different approach. Time you took it. Time you take the time you take the budget back to the drawing board. Rewrite it. It's an unfair budget, a cuts budget, and we'll vote against it at five o'clock tonight. Thank you. And I call on Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Rennie. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Over the last two years, the Scottish Greens have been determined to take the budget process seriously and to achieve meaningful change for the people we all represent. We've achieved a transformation, a restructuring of Scotland's income tax policy, which certainly the Conservatives don't like because they only care about tax cuts for the wealthy. We've achieved protection for local services year after year after year. But last year we made it clear also that local tax reform was urgent and would become increasingly so. Scotland has a centralised, constrained and underpowered system of local government and that needs to change. The package of local tax reform measures that we've seen announced today will make real progress. We have, for the first time, a clear, definitive timescale for publishing legislation to abolish and replace council tax during this session of Parliament. I'll give an in intervention to Mr. Neil Findlay. Like last year, Greens will not vote for a budget that cuts local government funding. Can I ask them, will local government funding be cut this year? Patrick Harvey. I'm coming on to the, the 1920 impact in a moment. The package of local tax reform measures includes that timescale for legislation to abolish council tax. And I hope all political parties will engage with that. It includes a commitment to legislation on a tourism tax, on workplace parking levies, on environmental charges such as plastic bags and cups increasing. And those measures have additional opportunity to raise revenue for local councils in the future. There'll be future, I've given an intervention already, I need to make some progress. There'll be future, devolution of control of non-domestic rate reliefs and we'll continue to make the case for going even further than the government has announced on that. 
and the return to three-year funding settlements, multi-year funding settlements for Scotland's local councils, with a fiscal framework developed on a rules-based approach to ensure that we know and that councils know that they can plan for the future. That, I think, is something that is long overdue and I hope something that all political parties will be able to support. The development of that multi-year package must begin early, well ahead of the next budget process. As for the impact of the 1920 financial year and the impact on local government in particular, as in previous years, I will not claim that this is perfection. I don't think the Scottish Government should claim that it is perfection. And even if the budget as published had treated local services fairly, we'd have wanted further changes. The shift away from high carbon infrastructure, won as a commitment last year, is still being achieved, but only just about, and SPICE research shows that it's in danger in the next few years. We'll need to see further progress on that. But as published, this budget did offer the potential of a crisis in local services. And even Derek Mackay's own party colleagues in SNP-led councils were making this clear to him. The overall package that we have seen announced today, including new money and new flexibility and new and existing local revenue raising powers, adds up to a package worth more than the COSLA figure of a £237 million cut to local services. Members shouting from this side of the chamber are well aware because they received COSLA's briefing ahead of the budget, just as we all did, setting out that £237 million cut. The package that we've achieved today more than fills that gap. I'll give one more intervention. Daniel Johnson. Are we saying that the, the new levies that they've been promised are going to be ready for the coming financial year? Because otherwise I fail to see how his, the statements he's making are correct. Patrick Harvey. Oh, no, I haven't said that at all. I've made a clear distinction. I have made a clear distinction between the long-term package of local tax reform measures and the short-term measures to improve the financial position of our councils across Scotland, which will close that £237 million gap for the 1920 financial year. Year, and I'm sure Mr. Johnson will read more into the detail of that when he's able to. The, I've given way already. I'm sorry. I, need, I have a, a minute and a half left to finish. Presiding officer, the budget process as we have it at the moment is not what it should be. We have a, a down-to-the-wire approach from the Scottish government, and we have a refusal to engage from most of the other political parties. The Conservatives uh, want a proposal that no other party will support. Labour produce an uncosted wish list and no meaningful ideas about how to fund it. Just because the budget is published in December doesn't mean this process is about writing letters to Santa. I can honestly say that of the people I've met in recent weeks to discuss this budget, some of those expressing the greatest frustration have been Labour councillors and colleagues in the trade union movement who wish to goodness that the Labour Party in Parliament was making some effort to actually make improvements to the budget. I wish they were as well. Presiding officer, I think our whole Parliament would be stronger and the outcome would be better for Scotland if all political parties took their responsibilities to do this seriously. I can respect anyone who busts a gut to try and achieve a change, is unable to, and then votes against it. But to not even try? Only the Greens appear to be engaging positively in the process. Others seem to think that engineering a crisis would be the best outcome instead of achieving changes that work for the country. It's as though some people look at the, the US government shutdown or the shambolic incompetence at Westminster and think they should do the same here. Chaos for the sake of chaos is not what Scotland needs. As a result of the Green Party's work in this budget, councils will not only have resources to put into their local services, but every party in this parliament will have the chance now to shape the future of Scottish local government finance. I hope they all take the opportunity to engage in that process more constructively there than they have with this year's budget. Thank you, and I call on Willie Reddy. Thank you, President Officer. We've heard that Derek Mackay has compared himself with Doctor Who. Patrick Harvey 
has said he would be the doctor's assistant. And for everybody, that's the one that takes the story forward by rescuing the doctor. I bet he wishes he could get in that TARDIS and go back into the time when he said he would never vote for a budget that did not include the abolition of the council tax. But just like last year, the Greens have ridden to the rescue of the SNP, nationalists together once more. The Greens have been bought cheaply. The extra money for councils was already available. Local government finance reform has been delayed until the next parliament, bogged down once again in another commission. Patrick Harvey has settled for the vice convenership of the car parking working group. <laughs> no, he doesn't seem to have even got that either. I agree the finance secretary that Brexit is the biggest threat to our economy. It could cost £2 billion in Scottish tax revenues by 2034, directly affecting our Scottish budget. The cost is high and it will affect the most vulnerable the most. Years of pain, turmoil and turbulence. Some people in this chamber agree with me about the economic damage and pain, but have given up on that fight. But I feel a responsibility to, to do everything I can to prevent this. Just like I feel the responsibility to prevent independence. There are striking parallels between the claims of the Brexiteers and those who argue for independence. The Brexiteers predicted it would be easy, the opportunity would be great, the easiest negotiations in history. The Nationalists here predict exactly the same about Scottish independence. But we know, just like Brexit, the cost of breaking up the UK would be great, in fact, even greater. That is why I make absolutely no apology for putting independence at the centre of our budget negotiations this year. It's not some distant threat in many years hence. The First Minister is already ramping up the rhetoric in our usual obsession. We made a generous offer to the Finance Secretary end the government preparations for independence for the rest of this Parliament. A short cessation. We didn't demand the SNP stopped believing. We said if you put independence to one side, we could work together on the needs of local government, the funding of mental health services and support for teachers' pay. But he declined, preferring to put independence first, just like they always do. We will not support a Scottish government that will use this budget as a stepping stone to independence and the economic damage that that would certainly bring. That does not prevent me from giving the Scottish Government some, I hope, helpful advice. The relationship between the Scottish Government and local government is not a good one and has got to change. The Scottish Government should not treat councils in the manner in which they say the UK Government treats them. Yet they play fast and loose with the budgets, demanding they do more, but failing to provide the funds necessary to cover those new responsibilities as well as their existing ones. Education is supposed to be the government's guiding mission. But right now, schools in my constituency in North East Fife are facing £500,000 off cuts. £500,000. And that is because this government has hammered local government budgets. No. We successfully harried the Scottish government to invest in mental health services. But the government are now playing catch-up and we remain unconvinced that the funds announced will feed through to real change quickly enough. Last year, we said that mental health spend should rise to £1.2 billion. But a year later, a year later, it's still £100 million short. That's £100 million that could go to the health professionals in the NHS, in schools and the police. But no, they're £100 million short. And we need a budget that puts teachers at the very centre of our developing economy in the years to come. Liberal Democrats were the first to advocate the use of new income tax powers gained by the Scottish Parliament. We said a modest rise 
secure, could secure a significant financial investment for education without resulting in adverse behavioural change. We were never in favour of ranking up tax at every budget. It was about the balance. Everyone knows the SNP broke their 2016 election manifesto commitment on income tax. But thankfully, their manifesto was wrong. The progressive change that was implemented has not driven taxpayers out of the country. But it's a delicate balance. I have a warning for the Scottish Government. Be careful with that balance. Do not play with the trust of the taxpayers again. If they believe that tax rises will come with every budget, then they may see behavioural adverse change. We must win the argument that modest, progressive tax changes can work. I want to give confidence that that progressive, modest change is possible and is good for public service. All of this could have been possible if the Scottish Government had put independence to one side, just for now. But the SNP's independence is more important than teachers' pay, than council funding and mental health. Well, we say absolutely no to that. Thank you very much. And we now enter the open part of the debate. I call Angela Constance to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Angela Constance. Thank you very much, President Officer. I hope to use my time today to uh, reflect uh, wisely uh, and calmly uh, on some of the, the challenges that we all collectively face uh, in our pursuits to make Scotland both uh, fairer and more prosperous. And I believe that we all have a role to play in that. And I also believe that we uh, also have a responsibility. And like the Cabinet Secretary, I'm very focused on the day job. So I want to start by raising a few very specific points. And hopefully this doesn't sound like my shopping list, because whilst not all the items are solely for the Finance Secretary to purchase, uh, the first one certainly is. And I've raised with Mr Mackay and other ministers at every opportunity through the budget process the benefits of enabling credit unions to access a small proportion of financial transactions within the budget available to enable investment to increase capacity. The Welsh Government have done this and as we know financial transactions just sometimes can be difficult to fully utilise. So as I'm an admirer of Mr Mackay's uh, to aid his consideration I thought I would quote to him some burns. Where sits our sulky sullen dame gathering our brews like a gathering storm nursing her wrath to keep it warm. So, uh, this sulky sullen dame is very much looking forward uh, to the Cabinet Secretary's response. And I also, President Officer, have the pleasure of serving on the Finance Committee, which is very ably chaired uh, by my friend and colleague, uh, Bruce Crawford. And as Bruce Crawford has already uh, said, the Stage 1 report uh, was published with unanimous support uh, from committee members, uh, despite uh, one of those committee members being Myrtle Fraser, who I have to say uh, in his opening remarks today sounded somewhat like a comedian at the Central Pier in Blackpool. Uh, but despite that, and despite, despite the, the complexity um, of the fiscal framework and forecasting uh, and the many different political views on Brexit, income tax policy and the constitution and so forth, the kitchen sink and everything else under the sun, the finance committee could still come to agreement demonstrating that if politicians are prepared to talk and roll their sleeves up, that a baseline agreement can always be achieved. Yet, what we've seen today is the two biggest opposition parties and the Liberal Democrats determined to obstruct uh, every uh, avenue. And it is a shame, no, because I'm going to use my time wisely um, and... <laughs> um, um, and I, I, I actually, you know, and, and try not to uh, do what Mr Kelly done and nearly burst a, a blood vessel. Um, <laughs> It is a shame that the approach has not fully permeated um, across the chamber. Um, and I have never in all my political life 
asked a unionist, whether a blue one or a red one or a yellow one, to ditch their beliefs. I have never asked a unionist not to campaign for the union, not to campaign for what they believe in, yet they have the audacity to ask uh, me and others. And I, and I may well be a rabid paint-your-face blue gnat, but if I can focus on the day job and on the budget, the business of the Finance Committee, if the Finance Secretary can lead the way in good faith and extending the hand of friendship and cooperation and budget negotiations, what on earth uh, is holding people back? Yeah. And in that vein... <laughs> And in that vein, I do very much welcome the increased funding and flexibility for local government. Uh, I know the local government's review is ongoing. It cuts across uh, all of the public sector and the community and voluntary sector as well. And the increased autonomy uh, for local government, I think, is the early fruits of that work and indeed the constructive challenge uh, from the Greens. And I hope it's a new chapter uh, on our public sector reform journey because, in my view, one of the great missed opportunities as a small country it was the failure of our predecessors to reform public services when public finances were comparatively good and pre-austerity. It will be much harder to continue a reform journey, but it is now more necessary than ever. And if I focus on just one quick example, the annual health resource budget has increased by 52%, £4.8 billion, since 2006-07. Good news indeed, but will we be able to increase that again by 52% over the next decade? I don't know. Will we be able to do so? Will we have to do so? And I hear colleagues of all political persuasions in the margins of committee meetings and parliamentary life acknowledge the need for courage and conversation and a commitment to working together across the chamber uh, for the challenges that we face uh, in our collective future. But that uh, commitment across the chamber has yet to fully uh, emerge, and perhaps the new all-year-round uh, budget scrutiny uh, will help uh, with the, the process. Uh, in the time I've got left, President Officer, I'll just say very quickly, we should always have the courage to invest in the long term. Um, our investment in housing uh, is a shining example um, of this. Uh, the £1.7 <coughs> billion pounds resource planning assumptions to local authorities to build for the future gives them confidence uh, and continuity to do that. And the record investment of £826 million, uh, for affordable housing is really welcome given it's a crucial part of the child poverty delivery plan, economic stimulus and increases the tax take. And if I can just finally say, uh, I very much hear Labour's calls uh, to increase child benefit by £5 a week. It's not a bad idea, it's just not the best idea. It would cost in the region of £250,000 per annum. It would lift between 10 and 15,000 children uh, out you of poverty. You must close, please. Um, whereas if we use the same resource differently, we could actually lift 40,000 You pounds. must 40, close, please. 40,000 children out of poverty. Thank you, President. Dean Lockhart, followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Each year, the SNP's programme for government promises new flagship policies to help Scotland's struggling economy. But each year, when it comes to the budget, we see that the SNP fails to deliver on those promises. Take the 2016 programme for government, which announced the Scottish Growth Scheme, promising half a billion pounds investment in the economy. But here we are, three years later, we see from this budget that only 20% of this money has been invested. In 2017, the SNP promised that a new publicly owned energy company would deliver lower energy costs. But two years later, this budget allocates no funding for the establishment of this energy company. This SNP track record of over-promising but under-delivering continued into the 2018 programme for government when the SNP announced the establishment of the uh, Scotland's National Investment Bank, promising £2 billion of investment for enterprise development. But when it comes to delivering this in the budget, we see cuts to the budgets of the enterprise agencies. 
We see funding of £130 million for the bank, not the £2 billion promised, and we found, find out that more than 90% of the bank's funding is coming from the UK Treasury in the form of financial transactions money, money which Derek Mackay described as a con when it was announced. Now, Presiding Officer, the SNP might complain about fin financial transactions money, but we welcome the fact that the Scottish National Investment Bank is being funded by the UK Treasury. This budget contains many more examples of how increased funding from the UK Government is benefiting Scotland. The overall budget is up by a billion pounds, spending on Scotland's NHS is up by 600 million, and the new 50 million pound town centre, referred, uh, town centre fund referred to by Mr Mackay is a straight pass-through from Barnet Consequentials. But to understand the full extent of UK Government support for Scotland's public uh, services, we need to look beyond this budget and look at the latest GERS numbers. As the SNP's very own Growth Commission report quite rightly highlights on page 33, the GERS report is a helpful starting point for an analysis of Scotland's public finances. We agree. And here's what the latest GERS report tells us about how Scotland's public services are funded. Public spending in Scotland for 2017-18 was £73.4 billion, but standalone tax revenues in Scotland were only £60 billion. Yeah. In other words, after 11 years of SNP government, Scotland has a net fiscal deficit of £13.4 billion. Yeah. That's the highest deficit between spending and tax revenues in Scotland since devolution. It's also the highest, I will in a second, it's also the highest union dividend Scotland has ever seen. Yeah. This financial boost that Scotland gets we'll from being part of the UK is now equivalent to £1,900 per person in Scotland. I'll give way to the member. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving away. Would he accept that the UK government has some responsibility, at least, for the Scottish economy? Dean Lockhart. Well, the UK government is responsible for monetary policy, and right now, interest rates and monetary policy are at historic lows. That's the support coming from the UK government. And if John Mason is trying to blame Scotland's underperformance on the UK government, why is the rest of the UK growing three times faster than Scotland? Yeah. Deputy Presiding Officer, to put this deficit into context, it represents 7.9% of Scotland's GDP. That's higher than the deficit of every other country in Europe and compares to a UK-wide deficit of 1.9% and an EU average of 1%. And here's why this deficit matters. If the SNP gets their wish of an independent Scotland in Europe, in order to reduce Scotland's deficit to 3% of GDP required by the EU Stability and Growth Pact, the SNP would have to cut spending in Scotland by £8.3 billion. So let me ask Mr Mackay, where would the spending cuts of £8.3 billion come from if he gets his wish of independence? And I'll give way if the Finance Secretary wants to uh, tell us where those cuts of £8.3 billion are coming from. Derek Mackay. Under independence, we would grow our economy and be amongst the most successful economies in the world. And in response, can I ask Mr Lockhart why he's avoiding the most recent, the most recent economic statistics, record low unemployment, record high exports and sustained growth on GDP. That's what this government's delivering for Scotland's economy. Dean Lockhart. Well, GDP numbers released just yesterday show that Scotland's growing just a third of the rate of the UK. Yeah. And Mr Mackay, this might come as news for you, but you've had 11 years to grow Scotland's economy. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, the Finance Secretary didn't say where the 8.3 billion of spending cuts would come from, so let me suggest uh, an answer for him. 8.3 billion in cuts is more than double the entire education budget. It's more than half of NHS spending in Scotland, and 8.3 billion is 75% of the entire local government budget. So there we have it, the real cost of the SNP's obsession with independence, public spending cuts of a level never seen before in this country. And as the SNP's own Growth Commission made clear, the financial and economic case for independence has never been weaker. Presenting officer, turning now to the budget. Uh, it's now clearer than ever that Scotland needs a new direction in economic policy. The SFC is forecasting another five years of 
economic stagnation. After 11 years of SNP government, Scotland has become a low growth, low wage and low productivity economy. But it doesn't have to be this way. Scotland's long term economic growth is 2%. And we on this side of the chamber believe that Scottish economic growth can return to those levels, but only with the right economic policies in place. But that won't happen with this budget. The increased taxes we're seeing in this budget, the triple whammy of higher taxes just agreed with the Greens, means that in the future we're going to see increasing divergence with the rest of the UK in terms of economic growth, tax revenues and spending on public services. And that's why we cannot support this no, budget he's today. closing. Thank you. Oh, in fact, he's closed. <laughs> and I now call John Mason to be followed by Jenny Mara. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Today we focus on the budget, and I think there are certain principles that we need to focus on at the outset. I think we're all agreed that we want good quality public services, and we want a reasonable and fair level of taxation, although the reality is across this chamber we would disagree on the details of both of them. Another principle is that we have to live within our means. That applies to each one of us as individuals, as families, councils, businesses, governments and parliaments. Those who try to live beyond their means will inevitably get into trouble sooner or later. If we want more expenditure in a particular sector, then we have to raise tax or cut spending elsewhere. That is where the Conservatives repeatedly disappoint me by their lack of financial or business understanding. They appear to be the only party here which is against tax and by implication against decent public services. But for them to argue that we should cut tax and spend more on public services is frankly impossible. Now, I well, let me just finish this point. I know that some of the Conservative MP MSPs are fairly intelligent, and that may or may not include Mr Fraser. So they do understand that income must equal expenditure. One has therefore to question their thinking in suggesting that expenditure can go up, but tax can go down at the same time. Mr Fraser. Fraser. I'm grateful to Mr Mason for giving way. I appreciate he may have written his speech in advance of this debate, but did you not just hear the intervention from Mr Mackay, the Finance Secretary, yes. on my colleague Dean Lockhart? Mr Mackay said the answer to this was to grow the, the economy. Yes. Is that not the answer that Mr Mason needs? Surely if Mr Mackay can argue that, so can the people on these benches. John Mason. What, what I did hear Mr Lockhart say was that he wanted more money for Scottish enterprise, and yet he wanted to cut tax cut tax at the same time, and that's exactly an example of what I was saying, even though I had written it before he spoke. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps more realistic than the Conservatives, Labour do accept that taxes must rise to pay for improved public services. But the question for them is how well thought out are their plans? Are they really arguing that no matter how high income tax is raised above the UK level, there will be no displacement of higher earners? Have their plans been examined and validated by any qualified body? I noted that Mr Kelly was calling for all parties to defeat the budget. Well, fair enough, that certainly could be done if the Greens were, let me finish this point, if the Greens eh, were not supporting it. But what is Mr Kelly's proposal for the next step after that? Will he negotiate with the Conservatives, because he won't cons eh, negotiate with the SNP, about tax cuts and service cuts? Presumably not. Will he negotiate with the Scottish Government about the top rate? Should it be 46, 47, 48, 49 per cent? Is he and our Labour open to real negotiations on real numbers, or does it suit their purposes better to vote against every SNP budget, no matter what it contains? Mr Kelly. James Kelly. I thank Mr Mason for taking the intervention. On the principle of fair taxation and fair funding, does he think it's fair that MSPs like himself will be awarded a tax cut uh, if the budget passes, whilst, whilst councils like Glasgow face millions of pounds in cuts. John Mason. I think the fundamental problem there is that the UK tax and national insurance system is fundamentally flawed. Why should somebody be paying, and a normal taxpayer be paying national insurance at 12% and when it goes up, it goes down to 2%? Now that is something that Gordon Brown and his other colleagues could have fixed in the past and have refused to go there so that national insurance remains regressive and causes a huge problem eh, for us in a devolved eh, parliament. Now, I personally am sympathetic to higher taxes at the top end, uh, and as I said, NIC is regressive, but uh, we have to be careful, I think, going from, say, 46 to 50 per cent or something like that. Uh, no one in here likes the constraints that we're under, um, 
But if we give more to local government, it does mean that somewhere else money is going to suffer. Just today, I noticed an amendment to a motion from Mr Finlay, deploring that local government has not received more funding since 2013-14. Of course, that is partly because we have focused on the health service. But Mr Finlay omits in his motion to say that he thinks the health service has received too much. Moving on to the Lib Dems, I understand they would not engage in serious dialogue in the Lib on the budget without the prospect of independence being taken off the table. Now, I have to say that I think we should be focusing on the budget today. Of course, we disagree on independence and many other subjects, but today we are looking at taxation and expenditure in the different sectors. There is no reason that parties which disagree on independence cannot at least negotiate on income tax rates or NHS expenditure and so on. I do wonder if the Lib Dems just do not want to engage and take any responsibility for the budget and an independence referendum is just Mr. an excuse in his last to stand minute. aloof. This parliament was designed not to have a majority. That means opposition parties have the privilege of defeating the government party from time to time. However, it also means these parties have a responsibility to agree a budget. Sure, there has to be compromise on both sides, but I do think the Lib Dem position is particularly irresponsible. Uh, I don't have uh, long to say what I would like to uh, about some of the Greens' arguments. I'm sympathetic uh, to them wanting uh, perhaps to move to a property tax uh, or something like that, as long as there is ability to pay taken into account. Uh, I also agree with the Greens' principle that local government should be more able to and more responsible for raising their own resources. At the same time, income and wealth is not spread equally throughout the country, and there always needs to be some redistribution from those who can afford to pay more and probably have less need eh, towards those who cannot afford to pay so much but have the greater need. Thank you very much. Jenny Mara, followed by Keith Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of my concerns about today's budget is that our spending in Scotland is not delivering the desired outcomes. Our public health record is getting worse with rising numbers of people reporting mental health problems. Alcoholism remains stubbornly high. Drugs deaths are the highest in Europe. Obesity is increasing all the time. On education, children's attainment at school is a huge problem. Presiding officer, it has been four years since any school in Dundee has seen a very good rating in a school inspection. And it is at least 10 years since any Dundee school has received an excellent rating in any of the categories and is in a school inspection. And it could be longer, but Education Scotland don't make this information available. Now, this is as a result of this government's cuts because these results cannot be unrelated to teachers coming out of schools as a result of SNP budgets. On health, presiding officer, the Fraser of Allender Institute said just in the autumn that health would soon account for half of all public spending in Scotland. The Auditor General reported last year that NHS Scotland was not financially sustainable. These warnings have not received nearly enough attention in this chamber. I think that's because of the current political crisis, but they must be addressed. I will in a minute, but they must be addressed as they call into question the future existence, I believe, of our health service. The Auditor General has told us that if we continue running the health service in the same way, with the same expectations, the same financial chaos, the same poor governance, the same top-heavy management structures, the same disarray and confusion between health boards, IJBs, ADPs, strategic planning partnerships, etc., etc., then the health service in Scotland is simply going to go bust. We need to radically plan a new modern health service that will guarantee we can still deliver care free at the point of access for generations to come. And that's what I think the new health secretary should be focused on. And that's what all progressive energies must be spent on. I'll take the cabinet secretary. Jean Freeman. <coughs> will the member recognise that the, the Audit Scotland report was published before the medium term financial framework, which has, I'm sure she will recognise has, if she has read it, deals with all of those issues and will she also recognise that I have in the past in this chamber said any time Labour want to come anywhere near me with a radical proposal I'll happily listen to it. 
Jenny Mara. The Cabinet Secretary knows I welcomed the medium-term financial framework. She heard me do so in this chamber. But that does not deal with that does not deal with the spending that is ongoing in the health service and the whole system that is really creaking at the point. And I would be happy to meet her any time on any of these issues, and she knows that. Let me give you a quick stark example. We have doctor vacancies right across the country. But the Careers Destination report told us that Scotland has the highest number of medical students leaving Scotland, leaving the UK for jobs abroad in Australia and New Zealand. So your government, Cabinet Secretary, is paying handsomely to train doctors, but they spend less and less time working in the NHS. That is not good budgeting. Let me turn from health to local government. COSLA has said that councils face cuts of 319 million across Scotland. Now, Derek Mackay has dressed this up with giving some ring fence funding for specific new work, but has taken with the other hand from core budgets, which will not help schools and attainment I mentioned earlier. It's a game of smoke and mirrors that has worked pretty well for this government over the years, giving with one hand and taking a lot more with the others. Now, he knows that Dundee faces nearly £20 million worth of cuts. The Council have not put a lot of detail on these cuts yet, apart from 400 job losses. Now, having faced years of cuts, the Council now finds itself considering compulsory redundancies, despite the fact their own party, the SNP, has a policy of no compulsory redundancies in the public sector. And when I asked her at First Minister's questions if she would stick by her policy for Dundee Council workers, the First Minister distanced herself from her own cuts and said it was a matter for the Council. Workers in the Yes City, as the SNP likes to call us, betrayed by their own First Minister. Yes, I will. Derek Mackay. Does Jenny Mara have the figure of income tax rise that would be necessary to fund the commitment that James Kelly has tried to make for local government? Surely Jenny Mara, as articulate as she is, has done the numbers here. Jenny Mara. Derek Mackay knows, as well as I do, presiding officer, that politics is about priorities. He chooses to prioritise things like the small business bonus and cannot get NHS finances in order. Labour's priorities are local services, and he knows that. He knows the situation in Dundee. He knows he led the Michelin Working Group as a result of the 850 job losses. 90 further jobs to go in Tesco in Dundee announced just yesterday. 380 jobs at HMRC closing in 2022. 1,300 posts to go at NHS Tayside. Now 400 council workers under the SNP council, many of whom have voted faithfully for his party. Given the perilous state of the economy in Dundee, I asked Derek Mackay again, he has announced £90 million today, but he knows that will not mitigate the £20 million of planned cuts in Dundee. Will he go back to Dundee and find a better settlement for our council? 400 jobs are at stake in a city that cannot take any more job losses. These jobs are in his hands. Will he act? Keith Brown, followed by Miles Briggs. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I am happy to support the general principles of the Budget Bill, including, of course, the general principle of investment in housing, £826 million for affordable homes, including £70 million of an increase on this year. In Clackmannish, this has included, uh, for the first time, uh, the 80,000 homes that we've created since 2007. It's included, for the first time, new council houses in 25 years, after years of Labour selling off council housing and not replacing it. I'm also pleased to support the general principle of raising attainment in schools, £180 million, including £120 million delivered directly to the head teachers to close the gap. This will benefit club managers, no, I'm going to make some progress. This will benefit club managers by around £3 million and sterling by over £1.5 million. I also support the general principle of funding for the sterling club managers city deal. We all know how our area was shortchanged by the Tories and let down by the two local Tory MPs but the Scottish Government will commit £50.1 million to our local communities, including the Scottish International Environment Centre and the Aquaculture Centre in partnership with Stirling University in my constituency. So I support the general principles, but I don't want to ignore the general context and the difficult context for this budget. First of all, if we listen to the uh, comments of Bruce Crawford and the Finance Committee, it seems to me there are real issues for this Parliament to look at in terms of the fiscal framework and its ongoing sustainability uh, for this Parliament. 
It also seems to me that in what everybody must agree is a difficult time for public finances, how smaller councils in particular can cope uh, with those difficulties. And I have advocated at COSLA the consideration of issues such as a, a small council supplement to help in order to make the economies of scale savings that are made more easily by larger council. But the context for this budget, of course, it includes the banking crisis and the failure of the Labour Party pre-2010. Uh, uh, we also have, of course, the Labour Party, the first to bring us the bedroom tax as their proposal. We also have the legacy of the Labour Party's time in power when the last words of the Labour government was there is no money left. But worse than that, in particular for our councils, is the legacy of PFI, Labour splurging on the credit card for PFI. And just to give the Chamber some idea of what that means, in my local council areas, both Clipmanager and Stirling, and Clipmanager, that means £9 million going for PFI out of a £120 million budget. In, in, in Stirling, it's £11.5 million, which is 14% of the education budget. This is at a time when Labour was buying one school for the price of two. That's what's causing the problems for so many of our councils today. In addition to that, of course, we have seen huge problems for the Scottish Government and legacy because they have to pay for things like hospitals and so on as well, which were conducted, bought by Labour uh, for PFI. So these are huge pressures. But in addition to that, the mess left by the Labour Party, we've got what the Tories have done. So the Tories have taken Labour's mess and turned it into a £2 trillion national debt. The Tories have created a £2 trillion national debt. They lost the AAA rating for the pound, the one that they said was uh, uh, totally defensible and was guaranteed. They've lost that. They've also, at the same time, splurged on an austerity programme. So missing all their targets right through the Osborne years, right up to now, in terms of public spending, in terms of reducing the deficit, in terms of reducing the national debt, they have still managed to have austerity, create all the hardship that we've seen and ruin the economy at the same time. And of course, they're going to sort that by Brexit. We are making a pretty bad job uh, of doing that. So we've seen the shambolic uh, conduct of the economy, both from Labour and from the Tories. And that is what we are paying the price of now. That's what's causing uh, so much uh, of this problem. And as for the, the comments of Willie Rennie, I don't know whether he was lucky enough like me to hear the comments yesterday of his former colleague, uh, Margaret Smith, who described his approach to the budget, that of saying to the SNP, stop going on about independence just now. Uh, and we'll talk to you about the budget. As, in her words, bizarre. She said, a Liberal Democrat said it was bizarre. And then Gordon Brewer added on top, he said, it's like saying to the Liberal Democrats, stop being Liberal Democrats for 18 months. Now, I think that was unfair because everyone knows that the Liberal Democrats have not been Liberal or Democrat for years. <laughs> the, the simple fact is, uh, and I think uh, John Mason was exactly right to say, this is a pretext that Willie Rennie takes in order to avoid doing anything constructive in relation to the budget. He then went on to talk about different elements of the budget he'd like to see changed. Of course, he never took a single intervention during the course uh, of that speech. He went on to go about different parts of the budget. Well, you had your chance to talk about those parts of the budget, and you chose instead to take a stupid gesture politics approach. And that is why you have no input to this budget. So it's up to the SNP as ever. No, I won't take an intervention from Neil Finlay. Uh, it's up to Mr. the SNP Brown, as ever. Mr. last minute. Stayed. I mean, in my last minute, I'd love to have taken intervention from uh, Neil Finlay. So it's up to the SNP, both in terms of in government and across the council, to sort out this mess. The response of the Labour leader in my local area in Clipmanager, when I said to him after the elections in 2017, because it's a difficult council, small council, do you want to try and join forces, see what you can do jointly to help the council? No, we'd rather create fireworks for you. That was the approach of the Labour Party locally. That's the approach of the Labour Party nationally. They've opted out of the process, and it's down to the SNP locally and nationally to sort this mess out, and I commend the details and the general principles of the budget as proposed by the Cabinet Secretary. Miles Briggs, followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Our Parliament will this year mark its 20th birthday. When this Parliament was reconvened, as a nation, we spent £8 billion on our NHS. Today, that stands at £14 billion, almost half of the Scottish Government's budget today. And so it's important to... Can I make some progress first? I'm not quite sure why you're intervening straight away. Calm down for a bit. And so it's important to set the context for this budget today. Thanks to the UK Conservative Government decisions, we see £20 billion a year in additional funding for our NHS UK. 
And what does that mean for Scotland? Well, this year alone, it will see the Scottish Government receive the biggest cash injection in the history of our NHS. We should all celebrate that. That will equate to £2 billion in additional spending for our NHS by 2023, as we as a nation look to improve our health and social care services across Scotland. It is yet again another example of the benefit and strength of sharing our resources across our nations in the United Kingdom. Happy to. Derek Mackay. That case, will Miles Briggs explain to the Chamber why it is he'll be voting against spending those Barnet consequentials on the health service and voting against extending free personal care? Miles Briggs. Well, let me educate the, first, the Deputy, uh, no, the Finance Secretary, whatever, whatever title he's got today. Because it was by working with Amanda Capel after my election to bring forward the private member's bill that has forced this incompetent government to bring forward personal care. And on the issue of campaigning, perhaps the Finance Secretary would like to tell the Chamber why he and also George Adam and also uh, Mr Arthur in this Chamber are only here because they stood on a platform to save the children's ward at the Royal Paisley Hospital. How's that campaign going for you, Finance Secretary? You sold out your constituents on that as well. But we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be pretending that the Point SNP... Point of order, Tom Arthur. Fit of rage. Here we go. It's not true. The member has just lied in the chamber. That is a blatant untruth. He will not be able to produce any evidence for what he has just said because there is no evidence. And if the word lie is unparliamentary, when I'm sure my meaning is clear. Can I understand that uh, Mr Arthur may be annoyed about that. The particular words were not used. And Mr Briggs, I haven't finished. Thank you. I would um, ask all members to take care in how they respond to different issues. And I would ask Mr Briggs to continue, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We should not pretend that the SNP finances and our health and social care, care service finances are stable with this budget. The past year alone has seen major challenges for NHS boards. The Scottish Government have had to write off £150 million in NHS board debt. And when it comes to NHS board funding, it's clear that in the small print of this budget, SNP ministers are willing to yet again continue to shortchange NHS boards. The Scottish Government budget as it stands today is simply not fit for purpose and continues to shortchange NHS Lothian to the tune of £11.6 million. Pounds. Willie Rennie. Would Miles Briggs be as concerned as I am to discover that the Greens deal today with the SNP involves a cut of £50 million to the integrated joint boards. That's not something that Derek Mackay told us about, and I think it should be clear to the Chamber exactly what this deal actually means. Miles Briggs. I absolutely agree with that point. I think already we're seeing the small print of this budget just showing where this money's come from for the Green Deal. How Lothian's two Green MSPs will be able to justify a cut for Lothian, we'll find out. Yes, very briefly. Andy Whiteman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Just to clarify for Mr Briggs and Mr Rennie, the £50 million is coming from unring fencing, funds that were previously ring fenced. This is something that I'm sure a number of councils will shortly welcome in Scotland and indeed have asked for. Much of that finance will be used to pay for precisely social and personal care that instead of going, being mandated for an integrated joint board will be used by councils in ways that they see fit. And that's something they've asked for. It's something that was clear in our budget negotiations that we need less ring fencing. Councils have been asking. Miles Briggs. I think that's the longest history uh, lesson, and also uh, it's a cut. It's a cut in funding, and for the for our social care services, a city he, he represents here, which is facing such debt in social care, how he will justify that to his voters, we will have to see. But just today, ministers down in England have outlined how they're investing in a 10-year plan for our health service. I very much agree with what Jenny Mara said today, because SNP ministers should look towards Audit Scotland's um, outlining where we need to go with our health service. Every year, we have reports on the state of our NHS, as well as the review of health and social care integration, which points to the immediate, immediate action that is needed if we're going to move forward our NHS to make it fundamentally change, but also deliver it for the long term. SNP ministers have shown little progress to date in actually delivering that over the last 12 years. Very briefly. <laughs> Kate Ford. I don't know how the member can justify campaigning for something and then voting against funding it. Miles Briggs. 
I don't agree this budget is fit for Scotland. That's why I won't be supporting it. And when I was elected, I said I would bring forward that member's bill. I did just that. After a long wait, the Scottish Government agreed to my request. We forced this Government to. And can I just say on this one issue, Frank's Law is a perfect example of the positive difference 31 Conservative MSPs have made in opposition. Just imagine, just imagine the positive difference that we can make to our NHS with a Ruth Davidson-led Scottish Government. Presiding officer, this is not a budget for Scotland. It is a budget from a tired and stale SNP government, which has run out of ideas and is running out of no vision for our country, our economy. Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland can do better than this. Tom Arthur, followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. And I think the speech we have just had from Miles Briggs illustrates what is at the heart of this debate. Whether one wants to engage in cheap politicking or one wants to take responsibility in a parliament of minorities. Indeed. Now, Miles Briggs raised the issue of Ward 15 at the REH. He uttered a falsehood in the chamber, a platform I did not campaign on. I have had quite enough of Mr Briggs for one afternoon. Uh, already made up enough. Can, can I halt this for just a minute? This isn't about a personal argument. Could you state your case in relation to that, Mr. Mr. Arthur, and be careful about your language Certainly during well, this political debate? Officer, this case debate. is very, very important because it gets to the heart. Because in the case of Ward 15 at the REH, the universal clinical opinion was that that was the correct decision. Was it a challenging one for politicians? Was it a challenging one for service users? Yes, but it was the universal clinical decision. That was a decision taken to benefit the people who use that hospital. And ultimately, as politicians, we have to make a judgment whether we listen to the professionals, whether we listen to the experts I know which the Tories have contempt for, or we just engage in cheap politicking and scaremongering. And I ultimately feel, and I much rather support a government that takes responsible decisions. But we see the converse. Because, of course, when Mr Briggs has an opportunity, when his Conservative colleagues have an opportunity to vote for Frank's law, for extending free personal care, to actually deliver, what do they choose to do? No, they choose to vote against it. Because I say talk is cheap, but standing up, taking responsibility, taking responsibility as a parliamentarian, living up to the responsibilities we have as MSPs, as legislators in this place, it is something clearly the Tory party are absolutely and completely incapable of doing, and that is why they will never be close to office in this country. <laughs> and I have to say, what a stark contrast to the way that the Greens have comported themselves in these negotiations. Now, to be honest, there are differences of opinion that exist between myself and my party and that of the Green Party, but they have shown the maturity to go and engage in a constructive process. But I wonder, what is it that the SNP and the Green Party have in common beyond independence? Beyond independence. They are both parties which are not looking over their shoulders to the remote control masters at Westminster. They are parties that will put the priorities of Scotland first. And it is a shame that as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of devolution, the Tories have reverted back to their hardline unionist stance. And what a shame it is to see the Liberal Democrats, a key champion for this place, to allow their unionism to trump their willingness to engage practically and with the government to go and bring forward budget proposals that will benefit all of our constituents. It is a shame, but I would just gently caution the Liberal Democrats. The last time they chose not to engage with the Scottish Government because of independence was following the election in 2007. And the consequences for them after that were going from being ferried about in ministerial cars to being able to fit their entire group in the back of a taxi. And I think the people of Scotland will remember their actions today as once again showing petty party, ultra-unionist politics yeah. before serving their constituents yeah. and the people of Scotland. Yeah. And as for the Labour Party, my goodness, my goodness. I was hoping to address my comments to the head of the Labour Party, that being Alex Rowley, who's the only one that seems to have a brain in the party and a willingness to come forward and to engage constructively. But have we seen that today? No. We have seen, as has been described, a never-ending list 
of requests and demands, but no account of how that should be, it's, uh, how the expense of that should be met. And you know, it is a shame because I know one-on-one -on -one in my conversations with many members of the Labour Party that we share similar values. We want to see a progressive, more socially democratic Scotland. I'm sorry, Mr Finlay, I've got far too much to say. Any other time I would be happy to, but not this afternoon. And it is a crying shame that you are not willing to engage. Now, I respect at the Labour can, Party... Can I we stop that. again, please, Mr I'm, Arthur? Please, please sit down. Please sit down. I just heard a word used by Mr Finlay, a member of this parliament, that I don't believe is appropriate to be used. Mr Finlay, I didn't ask you to retort. All I am saying is I heard a word that, in my opinion, as presiding officer of this session, is not appropriate. It is for me to decide appropriateness. I think you know the word, Mr. Finlay, because you are the one who used it. Mr. Finlay, I do not accept that. I believe you know exactly what you said. I would ask that if you have genuinely forgotten, Mr. Swinney, would you please be quiet? Mr. Swinney, would you please be quiet? Mr. Finlay, if you are unaware of the word, you can ask your colleagues or you can check the official report when it is published. You will have to accept my word at the moment for my feeling it inappropriate. Can I ask that the temperature of this debate, I'm speaking at the moment, can I ask that the temperature of this debate be lowered because it is becoming ridiculous. Point of order, Mr. Finlay. No, if I use the word that was inappropriate, I withdraw that word. But I would, I would hope that there would be a level of consistency in applying these rules in the Parliament, given that Mr Arthur accused people of lying and accused the Labour group of people with no brains. I would have thought that that was as serious an accusation as the word I think you're referring that I may have used. Mr Hepburn and anyone else who's here, could I please ask for silence? Mr Finlay, I have listened to what you have said. I dealt with the point of order earlier on that Mr Arthur made. I have subsequently stopped proceedings to say I would like a bit of respect shown on all sides. I would reiterate that. I would like to start this debate again because it is an extremely important debate for everybody in here and for everyone who is listening in. So, I believe you had a minute left, Mr Arthur. Please resume. Thank you. Presiding officer, and I, in a spirit of collegiate goodwill, will withdraw the use of that term, which I accept was inappropriate. But I am disappointed at the Labour Party because I know that in many areas we share a lot in common ground. Now, I appreciate that they are vigorously opposed to Scottish independence, just as I am passionately in favour of that. But that should not be a barrier. Because I say to Mr Finlay, I say to Mr Kelly, that had there been substantial, substantive engagement with the government, and then the Labour Party said, I'm sorry, we cannot find common ground, we cannot agree a joint budget, I would say, well, fair enough, I can respect that. But there is not. There is not a concrete set of budget proposals put forward. And when the Cabinet Secretary for Finance challenged Mr Kelly to name what his tax rates would have to be to meet his spending demands, he was unable to do it. When he did it to Jenny Mara, Jenny Mara was unable to do it. And I hope, if it is indeed Mr Finlay who is going to be summing up for the Labour Party, that he will set straight out exactly what his spending plans are and how much he believes that the SFC would forecast they would generate. Because if there is an unwillingness to do that, there is an unwillingness to take this process seriously. But in that note, presiding officer, I will conclude. Neil Finlay, followed by Joan McAlpine. Presiding officer, I was a councillor for nine years in West Lothian. I was, I was immensely proud of the work we did and the services that council workers delivered, supported by the progressive policy agenda we pursued. In 2006, the council was named UK Council of the Year. That was because we delivered high quality, efficient and value for money public services, so well run, so efficient and so uh, good value that since then the Council has had £92 million cut from its budget and this year it will have another 4.7 give or take whatever Mr Mackay has just chipped in. And of course 
Tell me, yes, tell me what the new figure is. Derek Mackay. No, I can tell you what you're going to say, because I've got a copy of your speech here. I don't know why you sent it to Scottish ministers. Uh, can I say you uh, can, can, can I ask Mr Finlay? Can, can I ask Mr... By the way, the figures uh, are now uh, all wrong in the speech, but can I ask Mr Finlay, uh, is Cosler wrong when they welcome the announcements that I've made today in relation to local government, which they have so... Are Cosla wrong? And would Mr. Finlay care to change his speech? And you can cut out the person that insults as well. No, Mr. Uh, Finlay, I think. I think <laughs> Mr. Mackay. I think he's got you there, Mr. Finlay. Mr. Mackay, I have to say, I have to say, the chamber will know about my computing skills. that have been there. Uh, <laughs> it most certainly, it must, it most certainly is not the first time I've shared information with uh, many members across the chamber. And can I absolutely assure you, it won't be the last, given my computer skills. <laughs> so, uh, but Mr. I'm afraid Mr. Mackay did not update us on the, uh, the new figures. But of course, it's not just West Lothian that cuts like this are happening to you. It's across every council in the country, affecting every single uh, community. But it's always the poorest. It's always the low paid. It's always the most vulnerable who are damaged this year. Edinburgh Council before Mr Mackay got, uh, Mr. Mackay got my speech, it uh, said they would have to make 41 million of cuts. And we see projects like the Pilton Community Health Project in real danger of closing because its grant has been withdrawn. What a state of affairs when a health project in one of the most needy communities in the country is going to shut because of your cuts. Yes, of course. Kezia Dugdale. For giving way. I think the closure of Pilton Community Health Project is one of the most dangerous and short-sighted things I've seen in my history in this place. I wonder if the Finance Secretary knows that this is an organisation which supports women in abusive relationships and people in temporary accommodation and that we will pay ten times what it costs to keep that service open, piecing their lives back together when this place shuts. In the time that the member's been on his feet, we've heard from Adam McVeigh, the SNP leader of SNP Council, who has agreed that it is no longer £41 million worth of cuts that Edinburgh faces, but £33 million worth of cuts. Does he think that's still a good deal for the citizens of this city? So £33 million Excuse me, cuts. Neil Finlay. And the Pilton project still going to be closed under your proposals. I'm sure the member sitting Pilton. beside you is absolutely delighted to hear that he will vote today for that project to be cut. It's an absolute disgrace. And if you look at Midlothian, one of the smallest councils in the country, needing to cut 4.1 million. Council officers have put forward a list of proposals. All school costs and patrols cut. Three libraries, three community centres. In Murray, 7.3 million of cuts. Almost the entire adult education service gone. Class sizes gone up to 30. Street cleaning reduced. Charges rising. In Dundee, 18 million being cut, 400 jobs going in Dundee, community facilities closing down. In Glasgow, one of the areas with some of the worst health and educational inequality in Europe, sports centres closing, community golf courses closing, swimming pools closing, seven libraries could close. And no thank you. In Glasgow, across the country, we've lost classroom assistants and class sizes are rising, nursery teachers are being removed from schools. And SNP Falkirk Council, schools are being told to cut back budgets. A half a million cut at Warburt High School on its own. And I hope you're enjoying my speech, Mr. Swinney. Uh, uh, Click Manninshire, they're talking of closing schools and reducing the school week, something Mr. Mackay tried in Paisley when he was the council leader 10 years ago. Well, well done, Mr. Mac Mr. Mackay. You're shortening the school week in Clack Manager 10 years on. What a great legacy that is. No thank you. The education is supposed to be Nicola Sturgeon's top priority. If this is how they treat their top priority, is it any wonder that other services that are not a priority are threatened by disappearing altogether? Uh, not a, barely a mention of schools in Mr Mackay's speech, and yet it's supposed to be the top priority. I have to say across the public services, but particularly in councils, the cupboard is bare. The cuts are not through to the bone, they're through to the marrow. They're eating away at the glue that holds society together because it's the lunch clubs, it's the youth work, it's the libraries, community centres, it's the binmen, the cleaners 
and the nursery staff who help civilise our society. They're being attacked by a Scottish government. That is utter contempt for councillors and councils instead once they centralise and dictate what goes on. And he has just dictated again the level of council tax rates that Scotland's councils can raise. Can you imagine the howls of abuse about a power grab that would come if any UK government attempted to dictate policy in areas that were devolved, and yet this is what has been done week in, week out to Scotland's councils? No thank you. According to the Accounts Mr. Commission, just the Scottish Government budget has fallen 1.65%, but they have passed on 6.92% to local government. And they've got the cheek to say this is a fair settlement. And finally, can I say this? Like, this listen to this from the Green website. Like last year, Greens will not vote for a budget that cuts local government funding. If there was no cuts last year, why are our councils on their knees shedding jobs and closing services? Now, I agree with Mr Harvey when he said at the you committee close, that the cuts are worse than Thatcher. The difference is tonight, I will vote against Thatcherite cuts. Tim and his party, they will vote for them. Uh, can I say to members, we have absolutely no spare time left. So if you come under the six minutes, please. John McAlpine, followed by Liz Smith. Thank you. Can I also congratulate the Cabinet Secretary and the Greens on reaching this agreement, which brings stability to all our public services at a time when there's total chaos elsewhere, particularly at Westminster. None of this is easy because, of course, the value of Scotland's block grant from Westminster has shrunk by £2 billion in real terms since 2010. That cut cannot be wished away, but it can be mitigated. That is what the public expect of their politicians. It is a lesson to the other opposition parties in what can be achieved with constructive engagement because the Greens, as we have heard, were the only party that came forward with a coherent plan to back up their demands. And I welcome the 187 million extra spending for local authorities. And Labour in particular will have questions to answer as to why they are voting against a, a budget that gives councils that ad additional funding. They will also have to explain why they're voting against a budget which gives our NHS above inflation increases. This budget delivers almost three quarters of a billion pounds extra for health. And indeed, under the SNP, since 2006-07, the annual health resource budget has increased by 4.8 billion, or 52.6%. Labour in September said the NHS needed to get the resources they need, uh, and particularly for NHS staff. This budget continues the commitment to lift the public sector pay cap, including a 3% rise for all those earning less than 36,500 a year. How does Labour justify or even explain voting against that? The Conservatives also claim to care about NHS funding in setting out their budget priorities on October 2018. The Scottish Conservatives called for the Barnet consequentials from the UK to go direct to the NHS and social care in Scotland. But those consequentials, of course, have been reduced by the UK by 55 million this year. Our budget takes the necessary steps to reinstate the reduction, or that particular reduction in its entirety, but the Tories will vote against it. Yes, I will. Miles Briggs. Can she not, just to find it in her heart maybe, to realise that this is two billion pounds in additional funding for our Scottish NHS coming from the UK government? Or is it just all about grievance and division? John McAlpine. The UK government promised to pass on all the consequentials uh, and they reneged on that promise which uh, the Scottish Conservatives asked this government to deliver on and this government has more than delivered on so it really should be Miles Briggs who is hanging his head in shame. Um, Mr Briggs, Mr Briggs as we have already heard has campaigned consistently for Frank's law and I, I campaigned for it too and I, I uh, I supported that campaign, but now, as we, we've now heard that he is going to be voting against Frank's law when he votes against this budget. The Tories are also going to be voting against the 800 more GPs which this budget will deliver over the next 10 years. And it's only last autumn that we heard Jackson Carlow demanding more money for primary care. We're getting 800 more GPs and the Tories are going to vote against it. They're also going to be voting against increases in carers' allowance, something else that Miles Briggs 
has called for. In government, the SNP has already delivered the first two payments of Carers' Allowance Supplement, and this budget allocates another £37 million to support it. I think it was Miles Briggs that said carers are counting on this budget. Well, carers might be counting on it, but the Tories are voting against it. On the other side of the chamber, Monica Lennon has been campaigning, like my colleague Gillian Martin, to extend sanitary provision for women and girls in schools, colleges and universities. This budget tackles period poverty, not just in educational establishments, but across a range of settings in the public third and private sector. So if Monica Lennon votes against this budget, she votes against that extra funding for period poverty. I could name other opposition members who have campaigned passionately, and I always believed sincerely for other worthy causes. Willie Rennie, for example, has articulated the case for more mental health spending for young people in particular, and he has articulated that case well and diligently. This budget will increase direct investment in mental health by £27 million, taking overall funding to an incredible £1.1 billion, and that includes specialist treatment for young people, an expanded distress intervention programme, and developing community services to support the mental well-being of 5 to 24-year-olds. If Willie Rennie votes against this budget today, he votes against delivering mental health services to those young people, something that he has campaigned for so sincerely, or so we thought. He also votes against an extra 500 million for early years in childcare, something else that he's campaigned the member, for. The member is in her last minute, will not shortly just, be concluding. Not just in this parliament, but indeed going right back to the parliament, the last parliament, I mean, he must have done it well. I, I still remember some of the speeches he made on that particular subject, but he's going to be voting against money for early years. I could go on because Labour, Tory and Liberal Democrat benches are populated by politicians who are all about to ditch their principles and vote against everything they have spent the last year campaigning for. The electorate will judge them, and I must say they must be very grateful to the government and to the Greens that they have come together to save the other opposition parties from the judgment of the electorate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Officer. Liz Smith, Liz Smith, followed by Willie Coffey. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officers. Spe several speakers this afternoon have spoken about why the context of this budget is so crucial. And the convener of the Finance Committee called on members to seek some consensus on at least a few issues. And I'll come to his comment in just a minute. But I hope the Cabinet Secretary for Finance was listening as well, because he seemed to be implying earlier this afternoon that it is the job of the opposition parties to explain why his unpopular decisions have come about. Now, of course, he's absolutely right to challenge ourselves and the other political parties to explain their policy commitments and in the next few weeks, our own sums in relation to the budget. But he has to be prepared to answer some key questions himself. Most especially, what evidence can he possibly point to to dispute the fact that following the Chancellor's announcements in October last year and the addition of the extra 950 million to the Scottish Block Grant, thanks to the Barnet consequentials, the Finance Secretary's own budget is up in real terms. A fact confirmed by the Scottish Parliament's own statistical office, many business organisations, and on what grounds can he continue to tell us that it is Westminster's fault when his budget has gained more money as a result of Westminster actions? I give way. Cabinet Secretary. More than happy to explain again, as I've done at committee and other places, and as backed up by the Fraser of Allender Institute, that we're passing on the Barnet consequentials, and because of the offsetting from UK government's reductions to other portfolios in relation to Barnet consequentials, that's what leads to the real term reductions to all other portfolios, excluding health. And that's the matter of fact that has explained how I can uh, say what I have said, and it doesn't detract from the fact that over the 10 year period, our budget for fiscal resource for day to day services has been reduced by £2 billion. Thank you for the opportunity of making that point once again. Liz Smith. So the Cabinet Secretary, I think, has just confirmed that his budget is actually up. And could I, could, I, could I ask him, perhaps, to explain why he thinks that increasing the tax burden in Scotland is going to help economic growth and investment in the Scottish economy, which we so desperately need? How do, uh, of, of course. Cabinet Secretary. 
a fairer, more progressive tax system that's investing in our economy is about quality of life and a race to the top and the quality of right, uh, life, not a race to the bottom in tax. And that's ensured that our economic indicators are all strong at this point. Liz Smith. Smith. C Cabinet Secretary, can I ask, have you actually read what the Scottish Fiscal Commission has been saying to you? No, sorry, Cabinet Secretary, I've already taken uh, two interventions. I, I have to uh, caution Ms Smith that you can't make up your time, so remember I that. I can make up my time. No, no you can't. can't. Well, that's all right. I think I've probably made sufficient points already. Um, Presiding officer, I think one, one good point is to hear that local authorities will get back at least some of the cash that they have been uh, taken away in the last few years. Because when it comes to education, the Cabinet Secretary knows full well that local authorities of every political queue have been having to take extremely tough decisions, like shortening the school day or getting rid of their school crossing patrol or increasing fees for music tuition or making redundant a classroom assistant. Because Cabinet Secretary, that is exactly what has been happening across all our local authorities. And I want to ask the Cabinet Secretary about a specific issue in his uh, agreement with the Greens, which uh, seems to suggest that there will be greater autonomy for local government and as Conservative, I, in principle, I don't see any particular problem with that, but it does raise an issue, Cabinet Secretary, about the choices that local government will have to make. And in the context of what the Scottish Government's policy is when it comes to childcare, the flagship policy on childcare, can I just ask whether that childcare policy will stay as it is or whether there will have to be choices made about that for local authorities, because I think that is a key point for parents. Cabinet Secretary. Policy stays as it is. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you for that uh, clarification, Cabinet Secretary. But what effectively would be happening if there is greater autonomy to be given to local authorities? What happens when they start to take decisions where they feel that because of financial pressures, they can't actually deliver some of the choices that they have actually been told to do? <clears throat> Cabinet Secretary. That, that, I, no, it is a proper debate, but you do know you're losing time. If I Thank keep you. getting questions posed, I'm trying to answer. No, absolutely. Officer. I'm not complaining. I'm uh, just, excuse me. I'm just reminding the member there is no spare time and I've just used some up. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> also, I'm very happy to take these interventions because I think the points that we're asking are absolutely crucial to parents yeah. and teachers across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. So the policy is fully funded. It continues to be uh, ring-fenced in the fashion that I've described, and the commitments are also uh, statutory commitments. So we will deliver the childcare policy. It's just strange that the Tories will be voting against it tonight. Liz Smith. Cabinet Secretary, can I be absolutely clear about this? When it comes to the delivery of this policy, are you effectively saying that it is the Scottish Government that will be delivering these 1140 hours, or are you now, are you now agreeing to allow local authorities to make choices about how they spend that money? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this is the most interesting that I've said repeatedly. We have a childcare policy. We're going to deliver it. We're funding it and we're going to go on with it. And it's only the Tories that are opposing it in terms of not providing the means to pay for it at the budget this evening. And you have 20 well, seconds. I, I think I, I rest my case, yes. Cabinet Secretary. I'm not going to continue this debate. I do rest my case, First Minister, yes. because there is a fundamental yes. point of principle here. And um, in, in the months to come, I think yes. you'll have a lot of answers to make on this. Thank you. I call Willie Coffey, the last speaker in the open debate. We move to closing speeches then. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer. It's been interesting, let's say, to hear the various unionist positions on the budget, the priorities, the demands, and even some of the bad-tempered twinges, moans and carps that are thrown in as usual. But what I have to remember is that we're arguing over the same cake and how to divide it up for the good of the people that we represent. If one party wants a bigger slice for their chosen priority, then it means a smaller slice is the result for somebody else. And it's incumbent, I think, in parties, I think, when making these demands for bigger slices, that they also set out who is to get the smaller portion. Otherwise, the public will see through that. While there's no mechanism in Parliament to present an alternative budget for approval, surely it's possible to set out a range of costed spending plans showing the public where that party might spend more. But it also has to show what area would get less. Because as everyone knows in here, the budget has to balance at the end of the day. The Scottish Government's budget provides Scotland with a stability sadly lacking at Westminster, where the current administration down there teeters on the brink of collapse on a near daily basis, unable to stick to the same plan it had last week 
or the week before. As some of my colleagues have noted earlier, this budget provides a huge shot in the arm for our NHS in education and offers a real terms increase to our councils both in both revenue and capital. And the news earlier that the Cabinet Secretary can use additional consequentials to provide further help to local government is very welcome. And it means that for my council in East Ayrshire, we will receive between an extra two and four million pounds on top of the proposed allocation. That means we at least will not need to cut the proposed allocations in the budget that we have already made to achieve this. The health and sport budget alone is now standing at over 14 billion pounds. It's been mentioned by several members. That's nearly a third of the whole cake, presiding officer. The NHS re receiving an extra 729 million pounds more next year if the budget is approved. In communities and local government, that includes paying our teachers, will get nearly £12 billion. The finance portfolio, which is mostly NHS and teacher pensions, will get around £5 billion. And education and skills, which includes funding for our colleges, gets about £3.5 billion. I list these, presiding officer, because these priority areas are pretty big slices of the total cake and account for about £35 billion of the total £42 billion available. And finally, the great news from the Scottish Government yesterday of the £100 million investment to support the Ayrshire growth deal was matched at long last by the UK Government this morning. So it will be interesting, presiding officer, to see if my Ayrshire Tory colleague John Scott will support the £100 million for Ayrshire or vote against it at the end of today. All of this, presiding officer, delivered with more than half of all Scots paying less income tax than the rest of the UK and 99% paying the same or less than we did last year. On the proposal for a share of around five billions of capital investment, this means for residents in East Ayrshire, another 300 new council houses and six new schools, which will be warmly welcomed in that part of the world. With equality at the heart of our budget, in contrast to the policies seen in the rest of the UK, we're doing our best to protect the poorest in our society, with £435 million of assistance directed from Social Security Scotland to those who need it the most. These are just the first steps in the delivery of even more benefits to support people in society as the Scottish Government looks to tackle inequality and to reduce poverty. I know that in my constituency over 1,500 carers benefited from the carers supplement and this will only improve with the Young Carers Grant provided for in this budget. Lastly, in one of my own areas of interest, the budget continues to support our super-fast broadband project with £600 million going into that programme, despite the full responsibility for this lying with the Tory government, who have put in a paltry £21 million. If we leave it to them, presiding officer, it would take decades before we reached the 100% coverage. Presiding officer, this budget offers something for every person in Scotland, from the youngest to the oldest, our teachers, NHS workers and patients, college staff, fire and police officers, our local government staff or students, those who work and those who are doing their best to find it. It encourages Scottish businesses to grow with the most competitive business rates environment in the UK and it protects our most vulnerable citizens as best we can from the worst actions of a Tory government that are getting worse by the day. All of this will be put at risk if the budget isn't approved. The Scottish Government has listened to and incorporated many of the suggestions from opposition members. No less than 16 of them asked for something, whether it was in Frank's Law, support for town centres, or even more help for Ayrshire. Having got most, if not all, of their wishes in the budget, are they really going to vote against the things that they themselves asked for? We'll know in a few more minutes if they really are that irresponsible. And I support the budget proposals that are in front of us today. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. And we now move to closing speeches. I call on Elaine Smith to close for Labour. Six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. This is not a standalone budget. It builds on cuts of past years. And it also must be viewed in the context that the SNP government have been in power for 11 years. So I think we need to look at that. 11 years on, and satisfaction with ScotRail has hit a 15-year low. So clearly, there's no prospect of Labour's request for reduced fares for their constituents. And 11 years on, homelessness is on the rise, and people are dying on our streets. And 11 years on, 
and Scotland's colleges have got 120,000 fewer students. And that means in our constituencies, women returners and disabled people are losing their courses. Jenny Mara uh, outlined very well the problems in her health service too, President Officer. But these are far from the only failures of this SNP government, because right now, in 21st century Scotland, one in four children are living in poverty. And frankly, that's shocking. Now, the SNP's answer to that is to reduce child poverty by 2030. That will be over 20 years since the SNP became the government. And I doubt if there will still be the government then. And today, of course, we found out that the government has only met four of the 15... I think we want to listen to what the Poverty Advisor said today. They've only met four of the 15 recommendations from the Poverty Advisor. The SNP are the government of a country where food banks have become the norm. Children living in poverty need action now, and this government has got the power to implement Labour's budget request and increase child benefit by £5 a week. Give me five asked families, what would they do with that £5 top up? Well, one mum said, I've got two kids, so £10 a week extra could allow us to buy fresh fruit and hopefully not rely on food banks so much. Well, I usually do, but Derek Mackay has said that the Labour Party haven't been engaging, and he knows fine well that James Kelly has met him on several occasions. So he's not listening. He's not listening to Labour MSPs. He's not listening to trade unions and churches and poverty Sit campaigners. Down, please, and he's not listening to councils. So no, thank you. I don't think I will. Presiding officer, 11 years on, and the SNP have the powers to mitigate the Dickensian Tory welfare policy, and they could support Labour, and they could use this budget to end the two-child cap and the repugnant rape clause. But it seems that that is not a priority. And 11 years on, and life expectancy in Scotland has dropped to the lowest in the UK for the first time in 35 years, with significant differences in local authority areas. And in North Lanarkshire, that means a variation of more than 10 years compared to parts of Perth and Kinross. And that, of course, brings me to the state of councils. 11 years on from the SNP taking power. Neil Finlay and indeed Kezia Dugdale made the point that it is not possible to deliver the services their communities need with a continued reduction in year-on-year -year funding and a depleted workforce. And it is not going to be possible to reduce poverty when the biggest employers and communities are being forced to shed their staff. And those job losses are undoubtedly the fault of this SNP government. And for households with the least Local government services are needed the most. And as Jenny Mara also alluded to, spinning ring fence funding as an increase really is just a big con. Now, Spice confirmed at the first stage of this budget that the local government settlement was a real terms decrease of 319 million. And let's remember that was only to stand still. 90 million core funding does nothing to fill that gap. It does not fill that gap. So, 11 years on, and preventing poverty and reducing its impact surely must mean properly investing in local government and not continuing to slash funding. Derek Mackay said at committee, every council has to make efficiencies, but there are no more efficiencies. Joe Cullinan, leader of North Ayrshire, asks if SNP Ron Falkirk is instructing its head teachers to write to parents about five million reduction in school budgets because it's going to mean a more efficient education for their children. And Keith Brown mentioned Clackmannanshire. Well, Joe asks if SNP run Clackmannanshire, considering closing primary schools and reducing the high school week, is doing that because it's going to be more efficient. And if SNP controlled Murray Council were more efficient, could they achieve a balanced budget? Presiding officer, this week I met with North Lanarkshire Labour councillors to hear firsthand their deep concerns. They cannot sustain the services that communities need with this vicious year-on-year -year financial assault from this SNP government. And the jam tomorrow deal with the Greens does nothing to change that. Jim Logue, let's listen to Jim Logue, NLC leader, in a letter to MSPs, the revenue budget for North Lanarkshire, as with all local authorities, has been significantly reduced over the last 11 years. This has meant a shortfall of over £230 million in funding over the last decade, which has had a devastating impact on the delivery of our services. £230 million. 
So in answer um, to uh, Derek Mackay's council tax announcement, Jim Logue tells us a budget settlement that gives a tax cut to government ministers while forcing councils to increase council tax on hard-working people across North Lanarkshire to pay for their services is not a fair deal. The Scottish Government have quadrupled the austerity it's received from Westminster and we can all see the impact cuts have had on our crucial services. Presiding officer, 11 years on, these ongoing cuts to councils are cuts to communities. This is worse than the Thatcher years and the same old Tories want to make sure that the, the rich don't pay more tax. But in answer to Willie Coffey, if I might, Unison tells us a different and better budget is possible by expanding the fiscal envelope. This government needs to think again and bring back a budget that properly invests in communities and puts income in the pockets of families to tackle poverty. Scottish no, Labour no, will no, not no, support I've been, this I've let budget. you go a bit longer. Thank you very much. And now call Adam Tompkins to close to the Conservative. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the context, Presiding Officer, in which this budget is set is that the Scottish Government's budget is going up yep. by more than a billion pounds in cash terms this year. This translates into a real terms increase of nearly 2%. And as we heard earlier from Miles Briggs, it includes more than £2 billion of increased spending for the NHS in Scotland by 2023. So that's the context in which the SNP seeks tonight to pass yet another pay more, get less budget, ensuring that Scotland will remain the highest taxed part of the United Kingdom. The second element of context, presiding officer, in which this budget is set is a context of subdued growth. The SNP's economy in Scotland lags behind UK economic growth and is forecast to do so every year until not merely the end of this parliament, but well into the middle of the next parliament. While SFC growth forecasts for Scotland are going down, OBR growth forecasts for the rest of the United Kingdom are going up. This costs businesses, but it also costs the public services dear. Earlier this afternoon, we heard the Cabinet Secretary say that in an independent Scotland, he would grow the economy to pay for the cuts that the European Union would impose on him. But he should be growing the Scottish economy now, presiding officer. The third contextual element that needs to be understood to understand this evening's budget is the SNP's broken manifesto commitment not to increase income tax rates. Seeking election, Nicola Sturgeon said in 2016, and I quote, that we will freeze the basic rate of income tax throughout the next parliament to protect those on low and middle incomes, unquote. Presiding officer, in the rest of the United Kingdom, everyone earning up to £50,000 a year pays income tax at 20%. Under the SNP's Scotland, by contrast, everyone earning more than £25,000 will pay income tax at 21%. That's a broken promise. And this, this, presiding officer, is the true foundation of this year's budget. Broken nationalist promises. Presiding officer, the choice made by the Finance Secretary is not merely to persist with this, but to extend the income tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, meaning that all those in Scotland earning between £43,000 and £50,000 will face a marginal tax rate of 53%. It means that public servants such as police sergeants, senior nurse managers and principal teachers will be paying more tax in Scotland than their counterparts south of the border, in some cases more than £1,500 a year more. Now, there is growing evidence, presiding officer, that this is already causing tax flight. People who would otherwise come here to live and work being put off because of the SNP's tax hikes. And people already here seeking to leave to escape the SNP's punitive tax rates. This is already costing the Scottish Government tax revenue. Pay more, get less. What we need, presiding officer, is a budget that increases the numbers of Scottish taxpayers, not one that puts them off coming here, puts them off staying here, or drives them away. <laughs> presiding, officer, presiding officer, the Finance Committee heard a week or so ago in evidence on the budget that for every 20 new additional rate taxpayers we attract to Scotland, the Scottish Government receives £1 million in additional tax receipts. Yet, 
When challenged about this in the committee, the Cabinet Secretary could identify not a single government policy designed to increase such jobs in the Scottish economy. It is higher wages that drive increased tax revenues, presiding officer, not tax hikes. And then we come to today's deal with the Greens. Mr Harvey has proved himself once again, hasn't he, to be something of a cheap date, selling out his own voters. He said that he would not vote for a budget that did not contain significant reform of local government finance. Yep. And yet what we see today is that that's kicked into the long grass. We are given yet another cross-party working group. As Mr Rennie said, Mr Harvey has settled. Mr Harvey has settled to be the vice convener of the car parking working group. That's the price of his deal uh, on the budget today. And I wonder if even that might be a little beyond his abilities. The Greens said that they would refuse to vote for a budget that cuts local authority resources. Another Green promise betrayed. Mr Mackay, in introducing his deal with the Greens Mr. this afternoon, Harvey, said that his budget me. was one that would create certainty and stability. Well, the only certainty is that we will have ever higher taxes for as long as the nationalist alliance between the SNP and the Green Party is allowed to dominate. He said that this would be a budget that would prepare our economy for the challenges of the future. Well, no, it prepares our economy for the challenges of future tax rises. Future tax rises with regard to tourism. Future tax rises with regard to hotel space. Future tax rises with regard to car parking. Future tax rises with regard to council tax. Even future tax rises with regard to the bags that we use to carry our shopping home in. Is it any wonder that this afternoon, presiding officer, the FSB, the Federation of Small Business in Scotland, has said this, and I quote, this deal with the Greens, this deal will erode the business community's trust yeah. in this administration. Yeah. Ministers repeatedly promised that they would not pave the way for tourism taxes without industry support. They're breaking that promise Whoa. today, unquote. <laughs> Presiding officer, we will be voting against this budget tonight. We will be voting against unnecessary tax rises. We will be voting against a budget that does nothing for growth. We will be voting against a budget that does nothing for business. And we will be voting against the budget that punishes Scotland's hard-working fam families. Thank you very much, Mr Tompkins. I close, call on Derek Mackay to close for the Government. Cabinet Secretary, please. Presiding officer, I think it's fair to say that in some days in Parliament we maybe don't have the most fulsome of debates. Um, it's also true to say that I don't always have early sight to opposition uh, speeches, but I thank Neil Finlay for early sight of his <laughs> speech earlier. Not, not right now. Allow me to make... Well, OK, OK. Mr Finlay. If I, I have to say to Mr Mackay, given my IT skills, this one doesn't even make the top ten. But I am an exalted company. As Bruce Crawford reminded me earlier, that he sent, uh, sent the entire programme for government to the whole parliament in years gone past. <laughs> Well, Neil Finlay has admitted that his IT, IT skills aren't very good, neither is his group's budgeting skills either, as we've seen from the course of uh, the day. Uh, Angela Constance, I thought, helped uh, establish some calm and tone to the budget debate and explored the issue about how we can be constructive, for example, exploring the use of financial transactions to credit unions, and it's that kind of constructive suggestion that I can take away. Uh, she did talk about her affection for me, and I can't say that I felt the love from the entire chamber uh, this afternoon, and I am indeed, I am slightly resistant to Angela Constance charms for reasons well understood uh, by the chamber. But in terms of this minority government, it's important that we, uh, that's a slow burning joke, uh, by the way, uh, but, <laughs> In terms, of, in terms of this minority government, I think it's important for our country to find the necessary compromise to provide the stability, the certainty, the economic stimulus, and really importantly, the sustainability of our public services. If ever there was a time for this parliament to be responsible with the challenges that we face, surely it is now and it is tonight for the sake of public services in this country. Yes, I've taken into James Kelly. Thank Mr Kai, Mackay for taking the intervention. In terms of sustainability of public services, we started the afternoon with 319 million put, cut to, to local council budgets. You announced 90 million pounds in direct funding. That still leaves a massive black hole of over 200 million pounds that uh, councils are going to have to find. That's punishing local communities, surely. 
Derek Mackay. At the uh, draft budget, I propose the real terms increase for uh, local government. The decisions that I'm taking today enhance that offer to local government. No wonder COSLA spokespeople are right now welcoming the movement from the Scottish yeah. Government yeah. about the deal to yeah. local government. Yeah. We are investing in the economy, in education and in the environment too. And I heard the Conservative talk about broken promises. And the biggest financial challenge we face right now, and the biggest uh, challenge to our public services and to our people is, of course, Brexit. Brought upon Scotland by the party that said you had to vote no yeah. in the Scottish yeah. independence yeah. referendum yeah. to keep Scotland in Europe. Yeah. And now yeah. we are being dragged out against our will in the most yeah. reckless fashion possible. I take no lectures from the That's Conservatives right. on economic <laughs> management. Yeah. Actually, those opposition parties, I will. Patrick Harvey. The uh, Cabinet Secretary for giving away. One of uh, Mr Tompkins' concerns was tax flight. Given that even if local councils use their full capacity to increase council tax, council tax in Scotland will still be significantly lower than it is in England. Are we facing the, the prospect of a potential tax flight from England to Scotland? <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. Hi. I, we would welcome people, of course, from across the United Kingdom to come to Scotland. It's the Tories that are hostile to migration to Scotland, yeah. not the other parties yeah. in this chamber. And it's also true uh, to say that council tax in Scotland will be lower than it is in England and the rises will be lower than they are in England. So we are taking reasonable decisions to empower local authorities. Mm. And the fashion that I've heard people from across this chamber say for some time. The economic indicators in terms of Scotland right now are good, only subdued because the uncertainty caused by Brexit. Seven consecutive quarters of GDP growth, some of those quarters outperforming the UK. Record low unemployment at 3.6%. Yeah. Record amounts of foreign direct investment, second only to London in the southeast of England. Exports soaring, all threatened by Brexit and the mismanagement at the hands of the Conservatives. But what this budget does is proposes to invest £42.5 billion in the services and infrastructure and welfare and social security of Scotland. Record sums for the National Health Service, real terms increase for education, more support for local government. Three consecutive years since I've been finance secretary of more than real terms increases for local government. Record investment in housing, more investment in transport and support for our emergency services. To oppose this budget doesn't just oppose the extra two billion pounds we are spending, but imperils the ability to raise the necessary revenues of tens of billions of pounds, imperiling £42.5 billion pounds of the Scottish budget. The Tories have lectured me. Uh, there's a good question, a good point made. I think it was Murdo Fraser that made the point. Who owns Scotland? And that tells you everything you need to know about why the Tories oppose our progressive and fair yes. tax policies. Yeah. Tax cuts for the richest hammer the most vulnerable in our society. That's not the path we will follow. Under our progressive regime, Income tax in Scotland will be fair and progressive, and Scotland will continue to be the lowest tax part of the United Kingdom. If we, if we had followed the Tories' tax policies, we would be cutting public services to the tune of half a billion pounds. I was listening to the Labour Party, and I was looking forward to Alec Rowley's speech because I know he was on the Labour speakers list until he put forward a, an idea about how we might fund local government. He was told by the Labour Party to, and I quote, shut up, he had no authority to negotiate with me, and he's not even allowed to speak in the chamber anymore on behalf of the Labour Party. That's what happens when you have a good idea in the Labour Party in this chamber. And I asked the, I asked the Labour Party, what is your figure to pay for your spending commitments? And they didn't give me the alternative budget. I was promised a shambles and they over-delivered in that regard. <laughs> the actual figure of taxes that they would need to be raised to pay for Labour's commitments is a 6% increase in the higher rate. That is a choice, but be honest with people of what yeah. you are proposing when you put suggestions to us. And I've been criticised for doing a deal with the Greens. 
I would rather do a deal with the Greens any day rather than the DUP that are backing the Tories and the House of Commons. Alec Cole Hamilton. Alec Cole Hamilton, on behalf of the Liberal Democrats, said in the Scotsman, we've made clear to the SNP we want a budget that focuses on education, mental health and local government. We've delivered on education, mental health and local government. But the problem is I didn't dress it up in a union flag, therefore the Liberals will vote it down tonight. Support for the most vulnerable in our society. Stimulation for our economy. Safeguarding Scotland's public services. A competitive business rates regime. I've held the rates on income tax on business tax. We're empowering local government. Some Tories said, some Tories said that Theresa May had more chance to get her deal through Westminster and the European Union than I had getting a budget through the Parliament. Tonight, we will succeed. First vote, first time, delivering for Scotland against the meagre, the meagre, ineffective, reckless, irresponsible opposition that we face. This has been months of hard work, but surely Parliament should now move forward to deliver to deliver a budget that works for Scotland, that protects us in the face of austerity, Brexit by accident, and a clear economic plan to support our country and accelerate that economic growth. This is a good budget for Scotland, and I have great pleasure recommending it to Parliament tonight. Thank you very much and that concludes our debate on the budget and we're going to go straight to decision time. So the first question is that amendment 15625.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser which seeks to amend motion 15625 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Budget Scotland number no. 3 bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15625.1 in the name of Murder Fraser is yes, 30, no, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The final question is that motion 15625 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Budget Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15625 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes, 67, no, 58. There was one abstention. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.